Hey guys welcome back to the channel this is story about what if Izuku has crashed core part 1 before I start. Please do support for more amazing content and comments for part 2. Do consider to subscribe my channel and share my video to your friends and check out the description as well. Let's start the video. Watanabe Urkuro considered himself an average man of average means. He worked full time in the advertising department at the Marimart Food Company which specialized in producing cheap bento meals and other convenience store foods. It was decent, steady work, and while he didn't see himself becoming a manager, after several years he'd slowly worked his way to a rather comfortable position. It gave him a steady income to rent a reasonably nice apartment in central Narihata, while he saved for an even nicer place. He also had a fairly average social life, though he'd recently broken up with his girlfriend of six months. That had been a bummer, but thankfully his friends hadn't let him mope too long. Last night they'd taken him out to several bars to celebrate his 31st birthday, the celebrations going late into the night, since none of them had work the next day. Most of the night was a blur. He had vague flashes of cheering, a drunken fist fight, and a group of girls with blue skin and orange hair cackling as they ran away carrying one of his friends. That last one should probably be concerning since he didn't remember seeing Takashi after that, but once he woke up he had more pressing issues. Specifically, hangovers sucked when you had heaks of vision. The moment he opened his eyes he regretted it instantly, all six eyes squeezing tightly shut with a hiss of pain, as the light violently assaulted him through the gaps in the blinds. A tired pain groaned slipped out as he shoved a pillow over his head. Heeks of vision, in his humble opinion, was a very average quirk that didn't stand out much beyond the four extra eyes. It didn't give him any hidden powers, it just gave him an increased field of vision, increased perception to detail, and the ability to see more colors than the average person. Which is why hangovers sucked when you had heeks of vision. After several minutes he forced himself to get up, reluctantly tearing the pillow away from his eyes. He grabbed a bandana from his bedside table, and tied it over the top half of his head, to cover up the top four eyes, leaving only the bottom two exposed to minimize the light sensitivity. Still, the light burned when he opened them. He'd glare at the blinds if it didn't hurt so bad. He got up and shuffled to the kitchen to make himself a late breakfast, maybe. A glance at the clock on the microwave said it was 1.12. Okay, lunch it is then. He grabbed some leftover curry rice from the fridge and tossed it in the microwave, checking the email on his phone while he waited. Most of it was the usual spam mail, text from his friend, someone asking if he'd heard anything from Takashi. Akuro paused when he saw one saying a package had been delivered. Come to think of it, he did order a custom coffee thermos online a few days ago as an early birthday gift to himself. His stomach promptly sank when he saw the email had arrived two hours ago though. A surge of panic shot through him, and he all but flew to the door, fumbling with the locks desperately before throwing it open. Almost immediately he regretted the impulse when he was fully assaulted by the bright afternoon sun. He ducked his head and shaded his eyes with a pained hiss, the light burning through even his makeshift blindfold to harm the forward shielded. However, when he forced himself to squint he could make out a cardboard box at his feet. A leaf washed over him and with a victorious sound he bent down and scooped up the package, holding it close to his chest. As he straightened up and started to turn he froze though, suddenly noting a black blob not too far away. It was his next door neighbor, I something or other. Aichi. Agawa, maybe. He didn't know, they never really spoke. The scruffy man stood at the end of the hall not far from the stairs, holding a plastic bag from the nearby corner store. Evidently he'd been returning from a rare daylight excursion to restock on supplies. For a moment they just looked at each other in silence, A-I-J-I-M-A, grumpy looking with heavy bags under his eyes as always, and Akuro with one arm still shielding the upper half of his head, and only two eyes peeking out. After a beat Akuro just gave a simple nod and retreated inside, closing the door and locking it before slumping against it with a tired groan. He had no idea what a moto, no, that wasn't it either, did for a living, but the man honestly looked like a vagrant. They'd only talked once, shortly after Akuro moved in, when the man visited to ask him to keep it down during the day since he worked at night. That was the only reason Akuro didn't freak out at the loud thumps next door, at the ungodly hours of 4 in the morning when the man would return. Whatever that job was, Akuro didn't want to know. He didn't want to know anything about the man. He swore he once saw the man with a stab wound, staggering into his apartment, just as Akuro had been leaving for his own job. Another time, Aikawa him closer, but still wrong had left the door open long enough for Akuro to see inside, and the room had been bare. No furniture, just a suitcase and a sleeping bag. Yeah, Akuro didn't know a thing about Ahar, and he absolutely had no interest in ever learning about him. All that mattered was that the guy hadn't stolen his package, whether that was due to him being absent or simply not carrying over all unimportant. Dropping off the box on the kitchen counter, he retrieved the now finished curry rice from the microwave, and sat at the table to eat. As he did he pulled out his phone to search for apartment listings. He'd only bothered staying here as long as he did because it had an easy commute to his workplace, up until the office moved to a new building last year. 
After that, he only put off searching because Xie no, to me is San. He mentally corrected himself with a scowl. They had broken up live nearby. Now that they broke up though, he had no reason to stay. He wouldn't be doing much else today anyway with this stupid hangover. So might as well browse some apartments closer to the new office. He paused only long enough to finish sheeting and carry his dirty dish to the sink, before returning to the seat to resume his browsing with his full attention. Maybe this time he could splurge on one with a balcony, he had a good amount saved up. As he scrolled through the listings he suddenly felt a sharp stab of pain in his forehead, making him flinch and hiss in pain as he dropped the phone. The hell. He growled to himself, reaching to rub his head. Friggin hangovers. His voice trailed off as his fingers brushed over the bandana, only to feel something hard and bumpy beneath the fabric. Sitting in shock for a second, he frantically tore off the bandana and opened the camera on his phone. It was still set to use the front camera after a deluge of drunken selfies last night, letting him immediately see himself. He clutched the phone tightly as he brought it closer to his face, eyes wide. What the fuck, he whispered, staring at the screen. Black, shiny material glistened on top of his forehead over his eyebrows, forming a bumpy looking ridge. With his free hand he reached up to touch it, the material smooth and slightly warm to the touch beneath his fingertips. What the actual GK. He cut himself off as his left shoulder suddenly twinged with heavy pain, even sharper than the pain in his head. The phone dropped from his hand as he quickly grabbed at his arm, only to feel the skin bulging. His head snapped to the side and he didn't know which was worse. Seeing the skin shaking and vibrating, as if something was about to burst out. But the black crystal that began to break through the skin around his knuckles. Tears filled his eyes as his breathing began to pick up pace, his whole body shaking. What the heck, what the heck, what the heck. The last thing he saw was the skin on his arm exploding, another arm bursting forth. Then, Watanabe Rokuro knew nothing. Meanwhile in Yusatafu, Midoriya Inko stood in her kitchen washing the dishes after lunch. Izuku had already bounced off to the computer room, something about a hero tuber he liked doing a big charity live stream today. Honestly, Inko would prefer her son go outside and play rather than coop himself up indoors. It was such a lovely spring day outside after all, and the weather had been so dreadful this past week. Alas, she knew today was not the day for Izuku to go anywhere though. Her baby boy had come home yesterday with fresh bruises and a splint on his wrist after an accident at school. A genuine accident, not some flimsy attempt to cover up bullying. The classmate had accidentally made some light bulbs explode, and a girl who'd been walking past Izuku's desk had been startled enough to trip and crash into his desk. She ended up breaking her arm from how it had hit his desk. Izuku had gotten away relatively scot-free compared to that poor girl, but the doctor said he still needed to take it easy. In addition to his wrist, his ankle had gotten caught on the leg of either his desk or chair when he'd been knocked over, and it had some minor swelling. Nothing serious, but still enough to advise against any strenuous activity. What a shame, she thought with a wistful sigh as she glanced out the kitchen window. They were still in the part of March where the season seemed to be in a constant state of flux between winter and spring. The weather had been so dreadful this week, fluctuating between rain that left everything soggy and windy days, that made it too much of a hassle to go outside. Today was the first truly beautiful day of spring, and he couldn't even enjoy it properly. Maybe she would make something extra special tonight for dinner. Last night she made Katsudin, his favorite, to make up for his bad day at school, but she could get something special. Something to celebrate the start of spring something with bamboo shoots, maybe. She did recently get a tempura recipe using some from Mr. Tachibana. Mind settled, she left the dishes in the sink to soak and check the clock. It was only a bit after 1.30, she could run to the store and pick up the ingredients and be back by 3 at the latest. She went to grab her coat and wallet, and quickly peeked into the computer room to let him know she was leaving. Inko stopped herself short though when she saw her son eagerly watching the stream, bouncing in his chair. She was too far away to see the monitor clearly, but she recognized the voice as a hero tuber who liked to talk about heroes' histories, rather than their fights. Things like the evolution of their public image and personas, events that inspired and shaped their careers. Sometimes he even got to interview pro heroes. Fondness swelled in her as she picked up Izuku's excited mumbling. He mentioned that a few pros would be appearing throughout the event, and based on his bouncing she suspected at least one was on screen right now. Seeing him so happy and excited, she couldn't bring herself to interrupt him even just to say she was leaving. With that in mind Inko turned and quietly crept away before he could notice. The trip would be quick, and he said the stream would last for most of the day, so he probably wouldn't notice. Just in case he decided to look for her she wrote a note and left it on the kitchen table before pulling on her coat and heading for the door. As she did she failed to notice the cap of a pen had fallen to the floor not far from the front door. She did notice when she stepped on it. The cap rolled under her foot and made her lose her balance, not enough to make her fall, but still making her stumble a few steps to the side. She swayed towards the wall, her shoulder colliding with it. In the computer room, Midoriya Izuku couldn't stop bouncing and shaking in his chair as the live stream continued. 
MACH7, one of his favorite hero tubers, had been talking about this charity live stream for the past month, and so far it was living up to the hype. It had started with Rock Clock next to him. They were in a park outside the hospital they wanted to raise money for with a bunch of kids and parents from it, so Rock Lock had shown off one of his tricks, and thrown a tile which he locked in place midair, and then jumped on it. Then, they went around borrowing some stuff from the kids, and he basically made a whole staircase out of all sorts of things. He even used a water bottle, which he then dunked into a trash can. It was so cool. After that, another hero named Manuel showed up, which had Izuku even more excited because he worked in Hosu, not Asuha city where the show was. Manuel had once appeared as a guest on MACH7's videos, and it was so amazing. And he'd explained back then that his classmate had been a patient at this hospital in elementary school. Izuku knew that this hospital had a special place in Manuel's heart, but he still didn't expect him to come out all this way. Izuku felt like he was hyperventilating as he watched Manuel use his quirk on the fountain to make water animals the kids called out. Usually Manuel didn't do stuff that fancy since his quirk required a lot of concentration, and even now the animals weren't that detailed. But still, Manuel was clearly trying so hard to make those kids happy and putting his all into the animal shapes, he was just so amazed and touched by it. When Manuel managed to shape a giant bird silhouette rising from the water, he seemed to reach his limit, and the water all fell down with a magnificent splash. Some of the closer kids and parents shrieked with surprise and delight as they got drenches. Everyone began clapping and Izuku joined in too, even if they couldn't hear. Wow, that was really impressive. MACH7 cheered. I think we're gonna need some towels for that though. Yeah, sorry about that folks, Manuel laughed, looking a bit sheepish. Luckily I had a feeling this might happen, so I came prepared. A sidekick from his agency and a few nurses appeared on camera carrying towels with Manuel's colors, handing them out to the people who'd gotten splashed. He jogged over to talk to them while the camera focused back on MACH7 and Rock Clock. Man, not even an hour in and we're already off to a great start. MACH7 declared cheerfully. The crowd's having a blast. Utero, what's the current donation count? 20 million yen. The cameraman declared cheerfully, and a small chorus of cheers rose up. That's a strong start, and I hope you keep up the momentum, Rock Lock said with a nod. The Minakata Hospital has a lot of patients with serious illnesses, so it always needs to replace equipment. Some people's quirks become a lot more destructive when they get sick. That's right, MACH7 agreed with a nod. I've told all you viewers before how when my sister had a brain tumor, it messed with her quirk, and she started secreting a corrosive mist at random. We didn't even know that was possible, her quirk is more of the harmless colored mist variety. Luckily it never spread far from her body, and the effect was pretty slow and weak, but she melted a total of 4 beds while getting treated. Hospital beds are not cheap, folks. Even if you've already donated, we definitely wouldn't mind you giving another one. Izuku just bobbed his head grimly, feeling a bit somber at the reminder. However, the mood didn't last long before MACH7 cracked a smile. But enough of that. We've still got another 5 hours to go before we end, so let's raise as much money as possible and more importantly, put some smiles on these faces. The crowd around him cheered enthusiastically, Izuku joining in. That's right. Rock Lock agreed with a nod and smirk. I've got to head out for my patrol unfortunately, but you'll be having more guests after this, right? Oh, we've got a lot of people scheduled to show up. MACH7 confirmed with a giant grin. Most are going to be a surprise, but if you want a hint. Utero's already freaked out. He's right, I spent 5 minutes straight screaming, the cameraman laughed, and Izuku's jaw dropped as he nearly fell out of his chair. The clock is coming. He all but screamed, his voice so high it came out more like a wheeze. As a longtime fan of MACH7, he knew Utero loved the clock. Utero said that a clock had saved him years ago before they started the series, and ever since then he'd been wanting to meet the hero again. This was amazing. This was more than just another awesome hero, this was a reunion Izuku, and so many others had been waiting for since the videos first started uploading. Of course even without the emotional connection to Clock Izuku would still be super excited to see him. His quirk was just so cool. It wasn't super flashy like a lot of heroes, way more suited for close combat, but... The loud crash from elsewhere startled him out of his line of thought, making him jolt and nearly fall out of the chair. His head whipped around to stare at the door wide-eyed, the stream forgotten for the moment. What was that? That definitely didn't sound like something getting knocked over or even his mom simply falling, this was much louder. Mom? He called after a second. What was that noise? He waited but got no response, and with each second his apprehension only grew. His heart began to hammer anxiously as he got off the chair, turning to face the door fully. Heroes don't hesitate, he reminded himself, and balled his hands into fists as he limped towards the door. He only made it two steps when he heard confused shouts from the computer, making him freeze and spin around. The crowd had started to shift and move, MACH7 looking at something off camera, as Rock Lock stood tall and attentive next to him. What there was something happening. 
Izuku stared at the screen for a moment, curiosity pulling at him, but then he forced himself to turn away and ran towards the door. The live stream could wait, he needed to check on his mom. Mom. He called more forcefully. Mom, are you okay? What was that? The question died on his lips as the living room came into sight, Izuku freezing in place and staring. His mom was near the entrance staring at Mr. Tachibana from next door, which made no sense because Mr. Tachibana wasn't in their apartment, he was in his. There was a big hole in the wall separating their apartments, Mr. Tachibana fussing over his mom whose shoulder was covered in bits of plaster and dust. Mom? Izuku cried more sharply, racing over. What happened? Why is there a hole in the wall? Are you okay? I'm fine, sweetheart, his mom replied faintly, still staring at the hole. I tripped and fell against the wall. Midoriya-san, that's not enough to explain how you made this giant hole. Mr. Tachiban replied sharply. These walls are sturdy. Trust me, I've fallen against them plenty of times, but the most I've ever seen is a dance. I've never seen someone hit it hard enough to demolish a whole chunk of it. I don't know what to say, mom said, shaking her head. I just tripped and hit it with my shoulder. I, I don't know how I did this. The last remark had Izuku's gaze zeroing in on her arm, and he gasped as he noticed something beneath all the dust and plaster. Mom, your sleeve's all torn up. He cried, racing over as quickly as his ankle would let him. His mom twisted her head to look at it, and her eyes widened at the torn fabric of her coat sleeve. Almost immediately she began ripping the coat off, making Mr. Tachibana jolt and shout in alarm. Wait, don't move your arm too much she stopped short once the coat was gone though, and all of them froze, just staring at his mom's perfectly undamaged arm. For a moment none of them spoke, and Izuku's gaze flickered to his mom's coat which had fallen to the floor. In her rush to remove it, she turned the sleeve inside out, and the rips in the fabric were much more clear without the dust getting in the way. The sleeve had been shredded, the rips far too big to fix up. Yet when he turned back to her arm, it didn't have so much as a scratch, even on places where the dust had gotten past the sleeve. Izuku was a smart child. He knew enough to recognize that his mom's arm shouldn't be fine. Even beyond the lack of scratches or cuts, if she hit the wall as hard as Mr. Tachibana said she did hard enough to make that hole it should have hurt her shoulder. Dislocated the bone or something, like Gorokan did in gym class that one time when he fell and hit the ground really hard. Despite that her arm looked perfectly fine though. Even now she slowly lifted it and tested it by turning and bending it in every direction she could, a look of wide-eyed wonder on her face. I don't feel any pain at all, she said softly. It is should hurt, but I don't feel anything. It feels perfectly fine. It might be shock, Mr. Tachibana said, but he sounded doubtful. They stood for a moment longer, and mom took a deep breath before turning to Izuku. Izuku, sweetie, why don't you go back to that list stream? She suggested, and he frowned. He knew she was just saying that so she could talk to Mr. Tachibana alone, and it bothered him they wanted to leave him out of this. Still, he didn't want to cause any trouble, so in the end he just nodded. Okay, mom. But you'll come talk to me when you're done, right? Of course, she promised with a smile. We just need to figure some things out. Just go enjoy your show for a little bit, okay sweetie? Okay, mom, Izuku agreed, and with great reluctance he turned and retreated to the computer room. Leaving his mom alone after that left a bad taste in his mouth, but she seemed fine, somehow. Besides, the list stream was still going strong, and he was still curious about what all that shouting had been about right before he left. By the time he reached the room there was even more shouting. Izuku didn't even manage to reach the computer before freezing at what he saw on the monitor. For several seconds he stood staring in shock, and then he spun and raced out. Mom and Mr. Tachibana had gone back to talking through the hole in the wall, but they turned to face him as he entered. Izuku, sweetie, I thought I. Mom, there's a monster attacking the live stream. He interrupted breathlessly, and his mom froze. Eyes widening, she turned and followed him back to the computer. Just as he'd said, there was some sort of monster battling the pro heroes. He couldn't think of another word to describe their opponent. It had long, gnarled arms with raw-looking reddish skin that swung around like like taffy. His face didn't look remotely human, either, with bulging eyes and a fleshy, hanging protrusion from its mouth, with that same mottled red skin as its limbs. The head was crested by white and red protrusions that formed a crown of sorts, and he could see more similar protrusions growing along its arms, as it swung at Rock Lock could barely dodge. The Lock Hero dodged the blow but didn't try to attack it, shouting instead at Manuel. As he did the fleshy protrusion framing its jaw abruptly rose and began waving his glowing golden needle shot out. Manuel wasted no time, using the fountain to create a wall of water to block the needles. The wall collapsed as the needles exploded on impact, making Izuku gasp. Oh my gosh, his mom whispered, hands rising to cover her mouth as the hero duo shouted something more. Izuku watched them surge into motion with a frown, noticing how they gave the monster a wide berth, even as it tried to swing its overly long arms again. Why aren't they fighting back? He asked aloud. There's a lot of people in that crowd, shouldn't they be fighting he trailed off as he finally noticed one other detail about the monster, a detail that had him suddenly feeling numb. 
It was wearing the hospital nurse scrubs. Neither mother or son spoke as they watched the heroes continue to avoid the monster for another 30 seconds before the camera abruptly swiveled to the side. His breath hitched as it revealed several people had taken shelter behind an earthen barrier of some kind, likely erected by one of the crowd members at the hero's request. Among the people in view though was Utero, the cameraman curled up clutching his leg. Utero rarely showed himself on camera. He had a minor cosmetic mutation that gave him large curling ram-like horns and fluffy white fleece in place of body hair. Now though now his bottom legs sported what looked like like leaves and twigs. Izuku had no idea what was going on, but he and the rest of the world would soon find out. Yamada Hazashi did not often visit Narihata on weekends. The ward was a bit distant from the part of Tokyo where he lived and worked. Besides, on Saturdays he usually liked to just relax at home, since he often stayed up until nearly 5 in the morning on Friday nights. Hosting a late night radio show was hard work, just because the on-air sign went off at 2, didn't mean he could always go straight home. Despite all that, when he got woken up at noon by a call from an Erhada based used electronics store about someone selling them a bunch of rare CDs, his ashy hopped out of bed and was out his door by 12.30. The store had become a favorite of his, having first stumbled upon it while trying to visit Shouta, emphasis on try, since the asshole hadn't given anyone his address. The store turned out to be a hidden gem with an amazing music selection, and since then he'd returned a few times and gotten to know the owners quite well. If they called him about some new stock, he knew it would be worth the trip. And indeed it was. His ashy beamed as he sat in the back combing through the box, marveling over the selection. Whoever had sold this box either had no common sense or was absolutely desperate for cash. The box included stuff dating back to the early quirk era, the sort of things that would make collectors salivate. His ashy would know, he had to wipe away the trail of drool from his chin at least once so far. While he sorted through, Korobashi san one of the owners sat at the table next to him inspecting his recently updated directional speaker. Have to say, the padding looks much better, the grizzled old man remarked lightly as he inspected the interior of the neck and lightly tapped the casing. Material sturdier, too. I'm still not crazy about having something so bulky around your throat, but I doubt it'll break anytime soon. That said, he set down the speaker with a huff, the device making a notable bump. It's heavy as hell. Yeah, I noticed, Hisashi replied with a snort and eye roll. My shoulders are killing me lately. He'd only been using the new updated version for a month, but it had been a very long month. His manager had taken pity on him and let him assign all his paperwork to an intern at the radio station, mainly because his arms were usually too sore and stiff to lift during downtime. Korobashi grunted, leaning back in his chair with his arms crossed. Give him a few days to reach out to some contacts. I've got to know someone who can figure out a better material for this that won't murder your shoulders. And that was the other reason his ashi loved coming here. Part of the reason his ashi vibed so well with this place was because Korobashi had formerly worked in the support industry before retiring. The man always loved getting a look at new gear, and never shied from pointing out how something could be improved. The latest improvements had been partially based on some of his previous suggestions, so his ashi had been more than happy to oblige his request to bring it along. Korobashi, if you can do that, I will be a loyal customer for life, he declared, and Korobashi snorted. You mean I didn't already have your loyalty? He quipped dryly, and his ashi shot him a beaming grin. Nope, you definitely already did. But I could. He was cut off by a loud alarm on his phone, his smile instantly fading as he snatched it from the table. That siren-like alarm was the one used for all emergency notices sent to pro heroes within range of an incident, and was only sent in particularly extreme situations. When he unlocked the phone he found a notice with the location pinned on the map. Villain attacking all pedestrians at Akakusa Apartments. Villain has some sort of crystal coating their skin that can be reshaped into spear-like protrusions, as well as large number of left arms. Villain has already demolished part of apartment complex. Apprehend immediately. His breath caught even before he finished reading it, not needing to check the map to know where to go. The Akakusa apartments were where Shouta lived. Korobashi, I'm going to need to take this, he said thickly, exiting out the app and turning around. The man had already opened the clasp on the back of the directional speaker, and his ashi gratefully pulled it into place. Minutes later he was running down the street, wearing only his t-shirt and jeans, directional speaker, and some knee and elbow pads Korobashi had lying around. As he ran he pulled out his phone and opened Shouta's contact and hit call. Most people might be up and about at 2 in the afternoon, but Shouta would most likely be sleeping at this hour. He worried his lip anxiously as it rang out, and he didn't bother trying to call a second time. At least it didn't go straight to voicemail, so the phone was likely intact and powered on. That meant Shouta was most likely fighting. He ended up hearing the fight well before he reached the apartment complex. Screams and crashes echoed clearly even from a few blocks away, and if that wasn't a clear enough sign, he also passed some people fleeing desperately. After seeing people usually run towards villain attacks hoping to see pro heroes in action, that wasn't it made his ashi run a little harder, gritting his teeth in anticipation. 
Then, when the battle finally came into sight, he skidded to a halt because what the actual fuck was that? The villain stood out right away. The black crystal coating its body glittered almost painfully in the sunlight, as it swung a freaking mutated looking blob of a dozen different arms right at a cement fence. If the blow wasn't strong enough to crumble it, the shiny black spikes piercing through it to the other side, definitely weakened its integrity enough to finish the job. The cement collapsed into a pile of rubble soon after the villain yanked back its multitude of arms, releasing an unearthly shriek as it charged at a nearby pro hero he only vaguely recognized as a junior from UA. His ashy's jaw dropped as he watched because seriously, what the actual hell. Over the years, he'd met enough people with extreme looking mutations that most of the time they hardly phased him, but this something about this just felt wrong. There was just something about the way the villain moved, how his blob of arms flopped around, and that sound it made all of it just sent an instinctive shiver of foreboding and caution down his spine, much stronger than the usual villain. He couldn't dwell on it for long though, and he swallowed as he forced himself to focus on the situation. He quickly assessed the scene. One hostile, with two pro heroes engaging it. At least two dozen civilians gawking or trying to retreat, possibly more inside, and it looked like one intern had taken it upon herself to direct the evacuation. His gaze flitted to the apartment building to get an idea of the damage already done there. Most of it stood intact, much to his relief, but that relief quickly faded when he realized the damage seemed to be centered near the end where Shada's apartment was. His stomach clenched with horror as his eyes snapped back to the battle, analyzing the scene desperately as he realized one key fact. Shada wasn't there. He wasn't fighting it. Panic seized him for a brief moment before it vanished, replaced by stone-cold determination. Yo, guys, clear the way. He called in warning to the two pros. They both turned to look at him, and he could see their suspicious gazes, no doubt assessing if he was a threat. One of them startled though, and Hisashi abruptly recognized him as being in the year below his Hizue. He clearly recognized Hisashi too and shouted something to the other, and they both jumped out of the way. With no one in the immediate path between him and the villain or beyond, Hisashi took a deep breath and screamed. It was far from the loudest scream he could do, but it was more than enough. The villain froze just as it had been about to swing at a parked car, its whole body suddenly shaking. No, not his body, his Ashi realized even while he screamed. The crystal. As it turned out, his voice was a perfect pitch for this particular type of crystal. He felt almost stupefied as the crystal coating shattered, the villain releasing a howl of pain that had him wincing in sympathy. With the shell gone his stomach only sank further though, the villain's disfiguration now on further open display for all to see. His Ashi had no idea what he was looking at, but this wasn't like any mutation or court backlash she'd ever seen. Six eyes bulged and rolled lazily in their sockets with glazed looks, the man's tongue lolling from his jaw which hung just slightly loose. Blood streamed down heavily from his forehead, not that he seemed to care. Worse though, his arms. The man's right arm looked normal, but the left one was just a giant mess of limbs coated in blood where Crystal had broken through skin. His ashy's initial estimate had been generous, because there were far more arms than then he realized. And to his horror the number only grew, the man's gait tilting towards the site, as more and more arms sprouted and started dragging on the ground. He charged at his ashy with a mindless look, somehow managing to lift the grotesque limb and reel it back over its shoulder. Several of the palms flopped listlessly with the motion, and smacked the nearby fence in the process, confirming in the process that the hands were still powerful on their own without the crystal spikes, when the fence collapsed from the light blows. Shouting with his cork wouldn't help this time. His ashy yelled as he jumped back just before the villain swung the abominable arm forward and slammed it into the ground. He nearly lost his footing when the blow fractured the pavement and created a crater with a web of cracks around it but fortunately for him, the villain's imbalanced weight meant he lost his footing too. He was knocked off his feet with a shout by the force of his own blow, and the other two pros quickly descended upon him. Knowing they had it handled and he wasn't properly equipped for this fight, his ashy tore away and charged for the apartment building. His heart pounded as he raced to the far set of stairs the usual one he used, had been a victim to the damage and all but flew up the steps to the second floor. Entering from this staircase felt disorienting, and as he raced to the far edge, he silently prayed that Shouda's apartment would still be there. His tension didn't fade when he realized Shouda's apartment had indeed been spared. The one immediately next door hadn't been. The floor crumbled away a few feet from Shouda's door, and he slid to a halt before he could reach the edge and pounded on the door. Shouda. Shouda. If you're in there, open up. No response, and he nod on his lip as he pulled out his phone. Please just be at the corner store or something, he silently pleaded as he hit dial. Before he could raise it to his ear he froze though, picking up faint traces of a familiar ringtone beyond the door. Shit. That meant Shouda was probably inside, so why wasn't he responding? If Shouda was alive, his ashy was forcing the bastard to give him a key. Actually, fuck that, he was going to just drag Shouda to his place after this, he couldn't stay here anyway. Since he didn't have a key, his ashy backed up and took a running start, delivering a very precisely placed kick at the door near the handle. 
It hurt to do it with his sneakers instead of his heavy duty boots, but he ignored the pain, and it only took a few more kicks before it gave in. The quick shoulder check had him stumbling into the apartment, staring wild eyed at the largely empty room. His first thought Holy shit, where is all the furniture? While Shouda had finally given him the address in case of emergencies, his Ashi had never actually visited until now. He couldn't believe his friend would actually live here. His second thought There is a giant hole in the wall. Apparently the apartment hadn't been as spared from the damage as Hizashi had thought, as the wall shared with the one next door didn't really exist, anymore. Some of it remained around the edges of the hole, but for the most part it had crumbled away. He didn't stare at it long, his focus quickly redirecting to a familiar yellow blob in the far corner. His heart skipped a beat as he raced over, unlatching the speaker so it wouldn't impede his neck, and tossing it to the floor uncaring of any damage. It clattered loudly as he dove to his knees, grabbing the blob and rolling it over to reveal Shouta. Izashi felt his breath catch at the sight of his friend's face in the opening of the sleeping bag, eyes closed as if perfectly asleep. No, he whispered, tears starting to form as he stared down. No, 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 no Shouta, fuck, no, not you two Shouta couldn't be asleep, not with all that noise from the fighting outside fuck, from the wall caving in. He grabbed the man's shoulders through the sleeping bag and began shaking, his voice rising in pitch as he pleaded desperately. Shouta, please, no, wake up man. Come on, wake up Shouta. Wake up, wake up, wake up. His voice rose with his quirk at the last syllable as he threw his head back with a wail, the tears flowing freely. He shouted, letting out all his despair and horror and anguish, as he continued to shake his friend. And then suddenly, his voice stopped. He startled at the abrupt disappearance, and his head snapped down to find a pair of very irritated red eyes glaring at him. His ashy, get the hell off me, shouta growled, bangs floating upwards around the opening of the sleeping bag. The only reason his ashy's shriek of delight and relief didn't bring down the rest of the building was because Shouta still had erasure activated and muted his voice. He wheezed as he grabbed Shouta's shoulders and pulled his torso upright into a tight embrace, the black-haired man grunting at the sudden impact. With the new position he couldn't use erasure anymore, allowing the blonde to babble freely. You're alive. Holy shit, you're alive. Thank fuck, I was so scared when I got that villain alert, and you didn't answer my call and, then I actually got here, and your eyes were closed, and... As he babbled Shouta began squirming to get free, but the sleeping bag effectively trapped him in place. His ashy, he growled in irritation. What the actual is it a hole in my wall? The man's angry threat fell flat with disbelief, and his ashy loosened the embrace enough to let the other man sit back. Shouta's gaze never moved from the hole in his apartment wall, eyes wide. Why is there a hole in my wall? I told you, there was a villain attack. His ashy replied. Holy shit, that guy barely even seemed human, Shouta. He was cut off by two shrill shrieks from their phones, startling both of them. Immediately Hizashi pulled out his phone while Shouta unzipped his sleeping bag to retrieve his own, and Hizashi felt his blood chill when he saw the notice. Emergency. Multiple reports of people transforming into hostile entities all across Greater Tokyo area. Current cause is unknown. At least one child included among reported victims. All heroes, subdue with as minimal harm as possible. What the hell? He whispered, looking up. Shouta, are you seeing this too? I think so Shouta stared at his phone with a bewildered look. Outside they could hear the distant whine of sirens, and his ashy had a feeling that sound would be the background track of the rest of the day. The ports of the sightings continue all across Japan. Even now, pro heroes are still engaged in battle in various cities. In Ko felt numb as she stared at the TV screen, the reporter's voice sounding very far away, as she struggled to process what she saw. The collapsed wall to the Tachibana apartment was the least of her worries now. For the past two hours, every news station had been reporting near total chaos on the streets as villains, and what felt like monsters rampaged. A state of national emergency had been declared, everyone told to stay indoors. Beside her Zuku sat with his legs pulled to his chest, watching the screen with furred eyebrows. Maybe she shouldn't let him watch this, he was only nine after all, but he had already seen the one villain on the list stream. Knowing him, he'd likely try to look it up anyway if she sent him to the computer room, and well, she didn't want him out of her line of sight right now. Mom, those people don't look okay, he said quietly. I know, sweetie, she said just as softly, biting her lip as another battle was shown. All of these villains looked horrific and twisted in some way, though thankfully none quite as grotesque as the one they'd seen on the live stream. Even now Inko shuddered, unable to forget the way the skin stretched as it swung its arms. However, she didn't know if that was really a good thing, because these. These look like people. People with glazed looking eyes, skin discolored and bodies that contorted in odd ways that looked so painful. One clip showed a man in a convenience store uniform with feathers all over his body, and limbs that seemed to inflate as he literally bounced out of the path of every blow angel's way. Another showed a woman dressed in an apron with drill-like growths protruding from her arms, and his jaw unhinged to a painful-looking extent to release an eerie red mist. Dylan didn't seem to fit these people at all. 
Monster seemed closer, like when Izuku had first called her to the computer room, but even that still felt wrong. Both words implied some sort of malicious intent, but these people's movements seemed more instinctual, more like mindless animals. Even as they fought the pro heroes, something just seemed so off. Inko didn't know what to call them, just knew she couldn't look away. The screen changed again, this time abruptly cutting back to the studio in the middle of an on-scene report. One of the anchors had run off, the remaining one standing up and facing off-screen with white eyes. Her head turned back to the camera, her mouth pressing into a thin line. Everyone, we just got word that pro hero Yuubami has been confirmed among those who transformed, she declared tightly, and Izuku's small gasp of horror echoed Inko's own. There is no video footage of the transformation itself, but reports say the snakes on her head have become vicious and grown larger, lashing out at anyone nearby. Some witnesses also report one of the snakes spewed some sort of mist from its mouth, and that she can now jump as high as two stories. At the moment she is being pursued across Tokyo by multiple pro heroes, mostly from roof to roof. Her voice faded to the back of Inko's mind as she covered her mouth, just thinking. Inko knew Yuubami more for her modeling career than her heroics, but even so she was a major household name. However, Izuku would know her much better than she did. When she looked over at her son his face was pale, eyes wide with disbelief. But that makes no sense, he whispered. Yuubami her quirk is serpenters. Her snakes just have heightened senses she uses to help detect and find people in disasters, but it doesn't make sense, they can't create mist. And she can't jump that high. It doesn't he trailed off, his lips wobbling. It's like she has two quirks, but that doesn't make sense. It doesn't, Inko agreed softly, but even as she spoke her head turned slightly to the giant hole in the wall connecting to the Tachibana's apartment. They had taped a bed sheet over the hole as a temporary measure, and cleaned up most of the debris, but she could still see some dust on the floor below it. Her mouth thinned, eyes flitting back to her arm which looked just as pristine as the last ten times she looked. It didn't hurt. It should be cut up or bruised or something, she saw the state of her coast sleeve, the large rips in it. There had been nothing to protect her arm after those rips were made, she should have been hurt. If not her arm, then somewhere else, her whole body had sagged against the wall after crashing into it. Yet the skin remained perfectly untouched, not even the faintest bruise remaining. As she hadn't felt herself crash through the wall, felt it break into plaster jab into her arm and side, she would have almost thought she hadn't actually touched the wall at all. But she had felt that, so clearly. And then there was what Tachibana said, about how the wall shouldn't break that easily from someone bumping into it accidentally. Her mind flitted back to the end of the lift stream before it cut out, the man with the ram mutation who suddenly had leaves and twigs sprouting from his legs. What if maybe, just maybe, somehow. Far across Tokyo, several pro heroes pursued the heroine known as Yuubami, as she fled across the rooftops. The muscles in her legs visibly scrunched up and coiled like springs to propel her with each jump, the enlarged snakes on her head lashing out at one pro who got a little too close. One unhinged its jaw and spewed ominous looking red mist at him, and the man recoiled back and screamed in pain as it grazed his arm. Todoroki Enji, better known as Endeavor, followed the chase from neighboring rooftops with one of his sidekicks, Kido, watching from a distance for the moment. They had only joined the chase in the last few minutes, having been busy enough handling another one of these people, his quirks had made them a much more volatile threat than usual. Yuubami still resembled herself for the most part, but even from a distance he could see the discoloration to her skin, and how her legs seemed to bulge with each jump. The mist made him wary of approaching her directly. From the few reports he'd heard, it seemed to have some corrosive or melting effect. Nothing overly powerful, but the people who'd gotten caught in it had the fabric of their clothes stuck to their skin. That alone wouldn't usually deter him too much, but he was more concerned whether the mist might be flammable. The last thing he wanted to do was accidentally cause an explosion. Today was chaotic enough. As he debated whether he should redirect his attention to other targets, one of the pro heroes pursuing the heron flung a mace attached to a chain at her. It made contact with her side and sent her flying sideways with a furious shout, and as she was flung away the snake that created that mist, suddenly spit at the chain. Benji was too far away to see what happened exactly. All he knew was that suddenly the chain had broken, and suddenly the mace was flying right towards Kido. Watch out. He barked to his sidekick, hand shooting out towards the bulky projectile as he spoke. And at that moment, he felt something in his mind shift, and air visibly swirled around his palm, and suddenly the mace was flying towards him. Then she stared in wide-eyed alarm at the swirling air, and suddenly changed trajectory of the mace head. Kido had already reacted at his warning, the bandages covering his body shooting out to ensnare the mace and stopping its flight. It didn't fall though and Kido grunted in surprise, the bandages wrapping tighter around the mace that was still tugging towards Enji's hand. Endeavor, I don't know what's going on, but it feels like it's being pulled towards you even with my quirk. He called, and Enji stared. Kido's quirk, traject, allowed him to alter the trajectory of any object that passed through his bandages. So for the mace to be resisting his quirk meant something must be actively pulling it. 
He lowered his hand and all at once the mace arced downwards, the sudden drop making Kido shout in surprise as it pulled his bandages with it. As he struggled not to not be pulled with it, Enji turned his hand to stare at his palm, eyes narrowing. What the hell? He muttered. What was that that feeling he'd had earlier, in the back of his mind when reaching towards the weapon? It almost reminded him of the subtle little shift in his mind when using Helflum, like a switch being flipped, but... Then that feeling suddenly surfaced again, and the air began swirling above his palm, and this time the flames around his face began stretching towards it. Enji jerked back as he promptly released Helflum, so the flames would extinguish. The mysterious feeling faded at the same moment, and the air stilled around his palm. His lips curled downwards as he focused on the feeling one last time, and then the air began visibly swirling again. Though he no longer had his flames active Enji could feel a sort of suction on his face, feel his hair and stubble ripple towards it. As he watched the small spiral his mind raced, thoughts straying to those people he'd seen today. The man he fought just before this who attracted wood like a magnet, attracted metal walls spewing acid that ate through metal. The other one with the clear insect mutation, including wings, and expanding muscles. And now Yuubami his limbs seemed to bulge and uncoil with each jump while her snakes grew larger and spewed harmful mist. In the background he noted Kido untangle his bandages from the mace, gaze focused on him the whole time. Sir? His sidekick asked worriedly. Sir, what's going on? His jaw clenched as he stared at his palm, air still swirling and trying to lightly pull in his hair. This is going to sound crazy, he said slowly, but I think I somehow developed a second quirk. Yogi Tashinori woke up in a bed feeling dazed and confused. The steady beep of a heart monitor was the first thing he registered, telling him even before he opened his eyes, he must be in a hospital. And that that was part of what made him feel confused. Not the fact that he was in a hospital no, the fact he was lucid enough to recognize that right after waking up. Logically, he should have been on painkillers. He should have been so doped up that everything else was left in a muddy haze. He could count the number of times he'd woken up in a hospital on one hand, and every single one of those times had been due to severe injuries that needed urgent treatment. Injuries that called for a lot of painkillers. Yet other than the usual grogginess from waking up from a deep sleep, he was able to think perfectly clearly. Clearly enough to remember why he would be in the hospital, at which point his eyes snapped open and he jolted with a gasp. His eyes darted around the room as his heart raced, quickly settling on a familiar face seated not far away. Sasaki Mirai, more commonly known as Sir Nidai, had a haunted look on his face as he sat in the chair next to him. His hair, usually combed neat and tidy, looked unbrushed with the golden strand lingering out of place next to his face. His suit looked neater, but still a bit more rumpled than usual. One hand covered his mouth, eyes trained on his phone with an almost wild sort of whiteness to them. Mirai, Tashinori gasped, and his sidekick his sidekick startled Mirai gasped and nearly dropped his phone, white orange eyes snapping his way as the man stared in obvious shock. His expression soon smoothed out though, relief coursing through him as he jumped to his feet. T Tashinori, he managed, and then stopped short, eyes flicking over Tashinori's form. Tashinori let his own eyes wander down to the blankets covering him for the first time, taking in the fact that it really was just blankets. Not a giant mess of wires and tubes like he'd expected. He looked back to Mirai when he heard the younger man suck in a sharp breath before speaking again. You're awake I just might have to become religious now, because that's a miracle if I've ever seen one. That was one of the weaker attempts at a joke he'd ever heard from the man, the delivery falling flat. Mirai Toshinori cut himself off with a cough. His mouth was dry, so dry. Mirai was at his side almost instantly, pressing a juice box to his lips. Toshinori didn't question it, just letting the straw slide in and coat his mouth with refreshing, relieving moisture. Apple juice, he noted distantly. Not bad. How do you feel? The other asked while Toshinori drank, and he had to pause to think it over. I feel fine. And he did. The grogginess had already vanished, and other than his mouth he didn't feel any pain. Which didn't make any sense. After all, he just... He sucked in a breath and pushed the memory away to focus on the present. Right now, he felt no pain even without painkillers. That meant a good amount of time must have passed, allowing the wound to heal to some degree. Taking a breath, he braced himself as he asked, how long how long was I out? At that Mirai faltered. 26 hours, he replied after a moment, and Toshinori once again froze because what? 26 hours. But how? He he was beaten so badly. He remembered getting impaled, getting getting. He shifted a bit, pressing a hand to his side beneath the covers. Even through the thin hospital scrubs, he could tell he didn't have any bandages. The spot didn't feel tender or sore. Nothing felt tender or sore. Even with healing quirks, that that shouldn't be possible. Not in just a single day. Mirai, he said slowly. What would happen? At that Mirai cracked a small smile and chuckled, but it wasn't a cheery one. No, the look in his eyes was more manic, his quiet laughter closer to hysterics than anything truly happy or amused. So much, Toshinori, he whispered, and his laughter grew a little louder, a little more crazed as he shook his head. So fucking much, you have no idea. 
Authorities are still struggling to understand just what happened yesterday. Most of the victims have been subdued and taken into custody for examination. Meanwhile over 100 other people have admitted themselves to hospitals for urgent examination across the country, though it's suspected many more are waiting for various reasons. Todoroki Fayumi listened to the news almost gravely as she sat on the couch of their living room, knees hugged to her chest. So very quiet. Yesterday had been loud and chaotic. Sirens had sounded late into the night, the sounds of battle occasionally drifting close to their house. She and her brothers had holed up in the living room watching the news coverage with white eyes, until Minami-san came to call them for dinner. After that, the woman had kept them away from the news, occupying them all with a few movies until they fell asleep on the couch. When morning arrived, Fayumi had been only mildly surprised to wake up still huddled in the living room with her brothers cuddled against her. The fact that she'd woken up naturally meant that father must have not come home last night, otherwise he would have woken them when he came home. All things considered, his absence didn't surprise her, the news coverage yesterday had made things seem incredibly hectic. But then Minami had told them he'd call to say he wouldn't be home at all, and he didn't know when he'd be back. It worried Fayumi, because he hadn't even called her, and he usually always did that since she was the oldest. Minami had no explanations, just shrugged, and said he claimed something urgent came up. Fayumi bit her lip as the television switched to show a photo of Yuubami. At present, snake hair Yuubami is the only pro hero to have been reportedly affected by yesterday's event, the news anchor said. After being subdued yesterday, she has been admitted to a hospital for urgent examination. No word has been given on her status at this time. More victims' identities have been verified since then, though authorities have refused to release their identities. It has been confirmed however that the youngest is a second-year middle school student. That made her suck in a soft breath of horror. Fayumi herself was only nearing the end of her first year of high school, and Natsuo was only a year younger than that victim. No one understood just what had happened yesterday, but it seemed to be completely random with the victims. More than that though the quirks. Rumors had quickly spread online about several people, claiming to have somehow developed a second quirk, either shared second-hand or claimed directly. The news avoided mentioning it entirely, but pretty much everyone knew about it. Fayumi had only seen a trickle of it on her phone, mainly from her friends texting her links to clips and posts on social media. Most of the video clips had a slew of comments calling them out as fake. She remembered one showing a girl demonstrating her obvious chameleon quirk, before lifting books using telekinesis, which led to accusations someone else off-screen was doing it. Another, with a teenage boy who spit out blobs of some kind of colorful ink that splattered in explosions of color on the walls, had multiple users mocking him as quirkless. Fayumi had to exit that one because the comments were just so cruel. Normally, Fayumi would just dismiss all the claims. People just couldn't have two quirks, it just didn't work that way. Even Shadow's quirk was a singular quirk, the two facets playing off each other directly. Her mom had tried to explain it once when she was little, something to do with chimerism, or hybridization, or something like that, but ultimately it boiled down to a single, very powerful quirk. People having multiple quirks just didn't happen. That had been before yesterday though. No matter how she looked at it, those people who transformed every single one of them seemed to have at least two quirks. Maybe if it was just a physical aspect she'd be able to write it off as someone else's quirk being used on them, but no two transformations looked remotely the same. Many of them obviously had at least two completely different unrelated abilities, abilities which couldn't be explained by physical mutation alone. Her mind flicked back to Uobami, in part because the news still showed that photo of her. The media hadn't released anything, but one of her friends had texted her a link to a shaky cell phone video someone took of the chase. The quality was low, but even then Fayumi could tell something was going on with her legs whenever she jumped. And then her snakes had spit something, she didn't know what, but it left a hole in a nearby wall. Fayumi had no idea what was going on. Nothing made sense. The crash from the kitchen had her startling and leaping to her feet with white eyes. That crash was loud, too loud to just be something getting knocked over. Natsuo. Shadow. She took off running as she called to her brothers, pounding towards the kitchen at record speeds. Are you okay? What was that? She trailed off as she burst into the kitchen to find the table and chair completely knocked over along with the door to the fridge, which now rested against the wall. Natsuo stood with his jaw hanging open, Shadow just staring blankly at the damage. For a moment none of them spoke. Then the fridge door toppled over with an even mightier crash, making them all wince, but it knocked them out of their stupor. What happened? Fayumi demanded. I don't know. Natsuo whined. One second Shadow was trying to reach up, and then the next his hand went whoosh, and suddenly there was a blast of wind that just knocked everything over. I didn't mean to. Shadow said faintly beside him. He still stared at the fallen furniture, eyes wide with disbelief. I, I can't do that though. How did I do that? I don't know, but dad is going to flip, Natsuo replied solemnly, and that had them all wincing. Fayumi bit her lip, looking at the damage. Yeah, they weren't going to be able to clean this up. 
They could pick up the table and chairs, but the fridge was missing the door and on that note, the wall had a noticeable dent in it. None of them knew anything about fixing that. As they stared at it she heard footsteps pound behind her, and Minami slid into the room. What was that oh my gosh. The woman faltered at the damage, eyes wide. Oh my gosh. What did you do? It was an accident. Natsuo cried. How do you rip off the fridge door on accident Minami asked incredulously, and Natsuo winced. Before he could answer, there was a sudden burst of wind and another crash. They all whirled to see Shadow standing with palms stretched towards the counter with air just exploding from it, with enough force it actually looked visible. Everything on the counter either blew to the floor or smashed into the wall, leaving small dents and cracks. As soon as it started it stopped, the wind dying in an instant, and dead silence followed for a moment before Shadow looked at his hand. I think I figured out how it works. He asked uncertainly, biting his lip as he looked at them. Fayumi just stared at the fruit bowl now embedded in the wall. Shadow, she heard herself ask. Why did you do that? I don't know. I wanted to see if I could do it again. And you did it in the kitchen why? Shadow had no answer for that. After several long seconds passed, Natsuo clapped his hands. Okay. So, we're running away now. We what Fayumi whirled to face her brother in shock, and he shrugged. Fayumi, Shadow just blew up half the kitchen. Dad's going to kill us, and then try to figure out how to force him into more training. So, we're running away. Minami-san, would you be willing to drive us or hide us out at your place for a couple days? Their housekeeper palmed her forehead. Kid, I like you guys, but I need this job, and I am not going to be murdered by your father for basically kidnapping you. Well, I guess we're on our own then. Natsuo declared, and turned to Shadow. Okay Shadow, go pack your bags. Are we really leaving? Shadow asked wide-eyed. Yep. No time like the present, let's move, move, move. But but, I still don't know how I did that. Shadow frowned at his palm. Wouldn't it be dangerous if we left now? What if it happens again? Shadow, you did it the second time on purpose, right? Natsuo asked, and Shadow nodded. That's good enough for me. Let's go. Minami's palm loudly met her forehead again, while Fayumi just stared, she would love to write this off as her little brother joking, but she knew him well enough to know he might be serious. She looked to Minami for support, but the housekeeper was shaking her head. Screw it, I'm going back to my room, she muttered, already turning to shuffle off. If you guys actually run away, I won't say anything, but I'm not having a role in this. So much for being a responsible adult. Fayumi turned back to her brothers, her mouth pressing into a thin line. Natsuo had moved to kneel next to Shadow, speaking in reassuring tones. Come on Shadow, life on the road won't be that hard. We can go hang out at my friend's house for a couple days, and then we can go buy an apartment on the other side of Japan. Doesn't that cost a lot of money though? Shadow asked doubtfully. Do you have enough? Shadow, what do you know about finances? Natsuo asked dismissively. I heard dad talking to one of his sidekicks about looking for a new apartment in Tokyo. I don't know how much your allowance is, but I don't think you can afford 100,000 yen every month. The number had Natsuo wincing and Fayumi sucking in a breath. Apartments tended to be very pricey in Tokyo compared to other areas, but it occurred to her Natsuo probably didn't realize how much apartments usually cost. He's right, she said, jumping on the opening. Natsuo, you can't afford to rent an apartment. And besides, they won't let you rent one. You're only in middle school. Natsuo frowned at that, seeming to think. What about dad's credit card? He asked thoughtfully, and Fayumi wanted to scream. He's got that emergency credit card stashed away in the kitchen drawer, right? We can use that to buy a bunch of stuff, return it for cash, and then just rent hotel rooms, or something. That was even stupider than the first idea. However, Shadow's sweet innocent, naive nine-year-old Shadow didn't know how utterly ridiculous the soul was, and seemed to be considering it. Why can't we just use the credit card to rent the rooms? Because dad would be able to track when the credit cards use, Natsuo explained patiently, while Fayumi felt the beginnings of a headache. If we return stuff and get cash, he can't track cash though. Okay. That seemed to placate their youngest brother who nodded slowly, apparently accepting the logic. Okay. Great. Natsuo stood up and clapped. Okay. Shadow, go to your rooms and pack your stuff. Clothes and any toys you want. Fayumini, can you help me find the credit card? Dad told you the pin code for it, right? The question directed at her had Fayumi snapping out of her stunned stupor, blinking and shaking her head rapidly. That was it, this had gone on long enough. Natsuo, she snapped, you are not running away. At the last word her voice suddenly rose in volume and took on an odd, echoing quality, bouncing off the walls. Natsuo and Shadow abruptly froze and stood straight to attention, staring at her wide-eyed and alert. Fayumi slapped a hand over her mouth, her own eyes going wide with disbelief. Fayumi, Natsuo said slowly. What was that? Fayumi hesitated to answer, suddenly not trusting her voice. She swallowed and forced herself to speak, keeping it to a whisper. I don't know the words were slightly muffled by her hands, but she didn't dare to remove them. Your hair rose, Shadow said, staring at her. 
and your eyes looked really weird. That had her startling, gaze snapping towards him in shock. My eyes looked weird. She repeated before she could think, and winced briefly before relaxing, as she realized her voice hadn't done the thing it just did. Her hands fell away from her mouth with a sigh, her lips curling downwards. What the heck was that? You want to maybe, ah, uh, try again? Natsuo suggested timidly after a few seconds, and Fayumi hesitated. Did she want to try that again? How does she try it again though? How does she do it at all? Maybe it's like my quirk, and then that wind dingy I just did. Shadow suggested, trying to be helpful. The wind dingy fell kinda like when I used my quirk, but different. His eyebrows furrowed, obviously trying to think of a better way to explain it, but Fayumi already felt a chill as something clicked. The second quirk, she whispered to herself, and her brothers perked up. What? Natsuo asked, and Fayumi glanced up at him. A second quirk, she repeated more loudly. People online a bunch of people say they have a, a second quirk. Or just, just a quirk, if they were are. Were quick quirkless her voice wavered on the last word as she realized just what she was saying. A second quirk. That was preposterous. People didn't magically spawn another quirk. People also didn't transform into monsters though. Fayumi, Natsuo said, voice oddly somber and serious. Yell at us again. What? She startled and gawked at him, but he met her gaze resolutely. Yell at us like you're mad. He told her. See if you can do it again. Shadow's right, your hair and eyes were acting weird when your voice did that thing, but I didn't get a good look, so I don't really know what it did. You were kinda mad when you yelled and you never get mad, and your voice hasn't done the thing again, so maybe you just gotta yell like you're mad. Fayumi just stared at him, and when she looked at Shadow, he had that same earnest expression that so supported, silently daring her to do that. For a second she just stared because, really, really. They wanted her to yell at them, just to see if she could do it again. And again, Shadow did just test if he could do the air blast a second time in the middle of their kitchen, and Natsuo had just been talking about how to run away. The fact they wanted her to test it wasn't surprising at all, her brothers clearly lacked some basic common sense. And know what? Screw it. Fayumi was always the responsible one, but right now something weird was going on, and her brothers had already been reckless enough. One more reckless Todoroki wouldn't change a thing. She turned and stalked out of the room, throwing out a loud, come on, over her shoulder. Her brother scrambled to follow, no doubt confused, but she didn't care to explain. She marched straight to the bathroom and slammed her hands on the counter, glaring at a reflection in the mirror intently. If her hair and eyes did something weird, she wanted to see it for herself. She took a deep breath and shouted. What is going on with me? Her voice shifted mid-syllable, pitched deeper and volume higher, as the echoing effect sounded again. In her reflection the whites of her eyes bled black, strands of hair rising from either side of her face, and floating up like like horns. As soon as she registered what happened she jerked back with a gasp and her eyes returned to normal, her hair falling limply as she slapped her hands over her mouth. From the corner of her eyes she could see her brothers staring, but they didn't say anything, and neither did Fayumi. Fayumi's quirk was thermal expulsion. She could produce and radiate thermal energy heat and cold but she couldn't create fire or ice like shadow. Basically, she could just make her body and immediate vicinity warmer or colder. A weak and passive quirk well, by their family's standards and one that had absolutely nothing to do with her voice or making her hair float like devil's horns. As she slowly processed this Natsu spoke up. Well, it's official. You guys both got a second quirk. Man, I'm so jealous, he added, folding his arms behind his head. I'm still just stuck with freezing things over. It feels so lame. Do you know you don't have a second quirk? Shadow asked, and Natsu paused. That is actually a good point, he admitted, and nodded. Alright, I'm gonna go to the dojo to experiment. Come on Shadow, let's go. He turned and stalked off, Shadow trailing behind, and it took Fayumi a few seconds to register what he just said. Once it did she jolted and spun around, racing after them. Natsuo, you are not training without supervision. Her voice changed again, second quirk no doubt activating again, but she didn't care. Her brothers were idiots, and she had to make sure they didn't get themselves killed. At the moment, this phenomenon seems to have exclusively affected Japan. Other countries have not reported anything like this, leading many to suspect this is the work of a villain or a network of villains based out of Japan. Shada barely paid any attention to the radio, wishing desperately he could sleep as his head slumped against the car window. Last night had been the single most chaotic night of his entire career, and today was no different. It had been hectic enough he hadn't even been able to sleep for a minute, the only rest he got was when he'd bundled up in his Ashi's car to be driven off to the next location. The public hadn't been given any official confirmation or notice yet, but Shada had. Whatever happened yesterday, somehow it involved hundreds of people getting new quirks, it seemed to be most common among children, people with simple quirks, or people who had always been quirkless. The transformations were already theorized to be the result of people receiving multiple extra quirks instead of just one. Shadow only knew this because as the erasure hero, he was in high demand. 
Suddenly he was getting messages pinging him to every hospital in Tokyo and the nearest prefectures to use erasure on panic patients who couldn't control their newfound powers. His dry eye was reaching new levels of irritating, he'd used up an entire bottle of drops over the past 24 hours, and was well on his way to finishing a second. At least he wasn't alone in his misery. His Ashi had volunteered to chauffeur him everywhere, more because he was probably freaked out by finding Shouda apparently comatose in his half-destroyed apartment. Normally he'd find the blonde's clinginess irritating, but this time Shouda honestly didn't blame him. He still had no idea how the hell he managed to sleep through his neighbor transforming and breaking a hole in their shared wall. He'd have only been asleep for less than half an hour by that point. He should have been nowhere near deep sleep. And even then, he was far from a heavy sleeper. In a way it was good he was getting called to so many hospitals, because he was able to get a checkup during a rare lull, but the doctors gave him a clean bill of health. Shouda was naturally unsettled by it, but he could only dwell on it during the car rides, when he wasn't being forced to use erasure on crying and panicking people. Honestly, he'd used erasure more in the past day than he usually did in probably an entire month. It had never occurred to him that he might have a limit of how much he could use it each day before side effects set in, but he thought he'd find out soon if he had to keep it up. Thank goodness they were done for now. The Hero Public Safety Commission had actually bent the rules and pulled a few civilians with similar erasure quirks to help out with the situation. The ability to nullify quirks was rare and could be dangerous in the wrong hands, so the commission kept a close watch on people registered with such powers. He'd been relieved at the last hospital by a woman who could cancel quirks through physical contact. Limited her from people who could make themselves non-physical, but he wasn't going to point that out. She'd be more useful than him if someone with an invisibility quirk had been affected, anyway. Now they just had one last stop, and then they'd go to Hisashi's apartment. Shada had already resigned himself to the blonde, forcing him to move in. He knew Hisashi would probably insist once he saw Shada's apartment, but the giant hole in the wall gave Shada even less ground to argue right now. He'd already silently decided he would claim the bed and force Hisashi to use the couch. Hisashi owed him that much, considering this last stop was a personal one. We're here. Hisashi declared, the car turning off, and Shouda peeled his head away from the window to look up. They were in front of a small ranch house, nothing too fancy or shabby. Totally average looking and unremarkable. He waited for Hisashi to exit before following suit, trudging after the blonde to the front door. Hisashi barely finished knocking before it opened, revealing a woman with silver hair tied in a bun and fuzzy deer ears that flicked slightly. Yamada-san, thank you for coming, she said pleasantly, and her eyes focused on Shouda. And you as well, eraser had san Please, come in. She ushered the duo inside, leading them down the hall. Hisashi made polite small talk, Shouda kept his hands in his pockets, and just zoned out their voices. Damn he felt tired, after this he'd have to sleep for 24 hours to make up for this. He only tuned back into the conversation when the woman stopped outside it door and knocked on it. Goro, Yamada came with the racer head. Great, send them in. A man called, and she slid the door aside for them to enter. A grizzled looking man stood in the center of the room, grinning at them widely. Hey Yamada, I hear you had a busy night last night. You did too, Korobashi, Hizashi replied faintly, staring at the books, pillows and tools floating around the room. Shouda eyed the object silently, mentally huffing to himself. I'm guessing telekinesis is new, he drawled, while thinking to himself, another one. This marked the third quirk he'd seen, which could be classified as some form of telekinesis. The man Korobashi laughed heartily. Yep. It suddenly triggered a bit after Yamada left yesterday. If you've stuck around a few minutes longer, you would have been in for one heck of a show. He added to Hizashi with a grin. Anyways, I thought I got it under control and headed home. But after taking a nap today it activated again and, well, I don't exactly know how to turn it off, you know. Shouda just grunted while Hisashi laughed and made more small talk, he didn't care to listen to it. Couldn't even if he wanted to, it was hard to focus with such little sleep. I'm just going to erase it now, he declared bluntly. Make sure you're clear of anything. Korobashi nodded and Shouda activated erasure, hair rising around his head like a halo. All at once everything in the room dropped with a series of crashes, and even before they hit the ground, Shouda had already blinked and went to pull out the bottle of eye drops. Yep, he'd need to get a refill soon. You sure you don't want to go to a hospital or something? Hisashi asked while he applied them. You should probably get this checked out. I should, but I'm not going until folks have a better handle on this, Korobashi replied, crossing his arms with a huff. You know I worked in the support industry, I know a bit more about how this stuff works than the average person. It could be weeks before they make any headway, and once you check into the hospital, no way you're getting out until they have some sort of idea what the hell's going on. I have a life I'd rather not put on pause, thank you very much. Shouda should probably try to argue that, but he didn't feel like it. He could respect this man's desire to avoid a lengthy hospital stay. Shouda would absolutely do the same thing. For the record, I'm not coming back to erase it if you have problems again, he said flatly, and the man flashed him a grin. Figured not. 
Now go back home or whatever and get some rest. You look like you haven't slept in a month. An exaggeration, but Shouda had been up for over 24 hours, and before that he'd been awake for 36, aside from a short two-hour nap. He definitely needed sleep, he was impressed he'd managed to remain so functional. Especially after using erasure so much in such a short time. Yes I don't have a limit outside the cooldown. I'm B2, so no complaints here. His Ashi proclaimed next to him with a loud yawn. Shouda glared at him, because unlike him his Ashi had gotten to sleep here and there while they were at the hospitals. Come on racer, let's head out. Shouda grunted and followed after him, not bothering to say goodbye to Korobashi. He barely even nodded at the woman who'd let them in, ignoring his Ashi's chatter and heading straight to the car. Thankfully he hadn't locked it, so Shouda was able to just climb inside and close the door, slumping against the window and closing his eyes. Right now, it was so tempting to just fall asleep. And he almost did before he heard the other door open, followed by his Ashi climbing inside. Okay, let's go home. He declared. I'd offer to stop by your place to pick up your stuff, but it's pretty much a crime scene, and last I heard the floor in your apartment actually collapsed, so that's not an option. Good thing you don't actually have anything, right? He laughed, but the sound was pointed, a certain scolding edge to it. I had a suitcase, Shada felt the need to point out. And my sleeping bag, and a laptop for work. That counts as having something. I am telling Kayama Senpai tomorrow, his Ashi declared flatly, and Shada groaned miserably. Great. Now he'd have her on his case too. Goodbye peaceful, quiet life. Maybe they'd let him move out on his own again after a few months. He could try to just run away, but they'd chase him down unless he left Tokyo entirely, and he'd rather not move than learn a whole new area. This drive already, he grumbled, and his Ashi obliged silently. The radio came back to life, this time a talk show with the hosts discussing the reports online of people with two quirks. The hosts were debating whether it was actually true, one arguing against it, but Shouda already knew it was. It would only be a matter of time before the authorities had to issue official confirmation, if only to encourage people to admit themselves to the hospitals for immediate examination. Shouda had no idea what the hell was going on with the world, and how all these people had suddenly spawned extra quirks, but he didn't care right now. He just wanted to go to Hisashi's house and go to sleep for the next year. Sadly, the year wasn't an option, so he'd have to settle for until the commission called him back to work instead. Hopefully they'd at least wait until tomorrow. Still, he'd be lying if he claimed he wasn't curious about what caused this whole mess. Toshinori felt numb. He didn't know how else to feel as he stared at the tablet Mirai provided him, slowly scrolling through article after article. His heart pounded faster and faster as he saw videos and photos of people with monstrous deformities, showing signs of more and more familiar quirks. The misty Obami snake spewed, the drill-like growths on that one woman dam, that one nurse whose arms had stretched and pulled at the skin in such a horrific way. The media hasn't been given confirmation yet, but many people have also developed a second quirk, Mirai told him, drawing his attention. His voice was quiet and subdued, more tired than Toshinori had ever heard him. I only know because some of them have been admitted here. There was a woman who could teleport in a range of two meters at a time who almost accidentally came in here. I saw a young boy with a clear limb mutation who can change the color and texture of his skin while I was in the hall, as well. Toshinori's jaw clenched as he grit his teeth, his mood grim. And you said, he said slowly, this started yesterday. After I he trailed off, but Mirai nodded. Yes. Right after you defeated all for one. All for one. Yesterday after so many years, Toshinori had finally managed to defeat the foe who had plagued him, and his predecessors had finally managed to avenge Nana's memory, and end this cycle after 200 years of conflict. The battle had been savage and long, and by the end, Toshinori didn't really expect to come out in one piece. He couldn't even celebrate though, not now. Defeating all for one had somehow done this. It had scattered every single one of his stolen quirks all around Japan. Toshinori sucked in a breath at the thought, hands shaking around the edge of the tablet. Before passing out he remembered seeing a dark cloud with red lightning sparking through it, letting him know something would happen, but he hadn't expected what could you even call this. The emergence of quirks was the only thing in history that came close. A second sudden cork boom, impacting people at random. Not even he had been spared. The sole reason he was in such good condition now the sole reason he was even awake, let alone alive was, because he had gotten some sort of healing quirk. Mirai said they'd found him in some sort of state of regeneration, though it hadn't really helped with the worst of his injuries. When he had tearfully used his foresight on Toshinori, he saw a recovery girl kissing him and the healing accelerating, which prompted them to call her. Of all the quirks to receive from his foe's demise, the fact he got a healing quirk that left him in perfect shape, left him wanting to laugh. It was almost like some last slight against his foe nemesis, that all for one's own power had ultimately been what saved Toshinori's life. He couldn't enjoy the irony of it though, not when that same event warped so many innocent people into mindless monsters. He knew enough from Nana and Gran Torino to understand that those people were beyond saving. 
all for one rarely gifted people multiple quirks, as it tended to overload their brains and leave them mindless. Over the years he had occasionally given relatively useless quirks to particularly pesky foes, to leave a message that could be at times heavier than if he had simply killed them. According to Nana, he had done it to a friend of her mentors, and had later taken back all three quirks, just to show it couldn't be reversed. Tashinori just felt grateful that some people hadn't been adversely impacted by this. That they didn't get corrupted by the extra quirk, that their bodies seemed to accept the second quirk. That didn't mark the end of the battle though. Based on the data Mirai had received and pulled up in one of the tabs, the distribution of quirks seemed to be mostly random. There would be a high learning curve for some of these quirks, and others might not mesh well with the owner's original one. He sighed tiredly as he held out the tablet to Mirai to take it back. When do you think I'll be cleared to leave? He asked. He'd already been missing from the public eye for over 24 hours, missing the worst of the disaster. Mirai had worked with the PR department at his agency to issue a statement that he'd had a sudden case of appendicitis to explain his absence. Which explained the mountain of presence already gathered in one corner of the room. It was one of the most ridiculous excuses he'd ever heard, but then, he couldn't really come out and say he'd been injured in a battle with a villain, and needed to recuperate. People would want to know who that villain was, and that would lead to public unrest and questions he'd rather not answer. Still, the public needed All Might now more than ever. He could surely at least make some sort of showing, even if he was supposedly recuperating from the non-existent operation. Mirai frowned as he took the tablet from him. I don't know, he admitted slowly. The doctor's and recovery girl want to keep you here for observation. We don't know how that healing quirk works he trailed off as he looked at the tablet, blinking slowly as he turned it over in his hands. Toshinori. There are glowing handprints on the edges of the screen. Toshinori startled. What? Mirai lifted the tablet to show him its back, and sure enough, there were glowing palm prints on either edge of the device, lining up perfectly with where he'd gripped it. Toshinori blinked slowly and looked at his hands. Hesitating, he slowly reached for the covers and lifted it, and in the shadows, he could see more handprints along the sheets and the side of his shirt. For a moment neither of them spoke. You're sure I have a healing cork now, right? He asked faintly. Yes, yes I am. And you don't think that maybe the glowing handprints are a side effect of that healing? I sincerely doubt that. Two quirks. Toshinori got two quirks from his nemesis. He templed his fingers near his forehead, grinding his teeth. Nana, give me strength. The day of March 19th was supposed to be unremarkable for all of Japan. The downfall of All for One would never be public knowledge, and no one would have any reason to remember that day. Instead, it would now go down in history as the start of the second quirk boom. If the appearance of quirks shook the world, then this was the aftershock. Bye mom, I'm off to school. Alright dear, have a good day. Izuka waved to his mother as he headed to the door, buttoning the last button on his Gakuren jacket and tugging his backpack over his shoulder. The second he opened it he froze though, finding himself greeted by a heavy sheet of rain beyond the walkway leading to their apartment. Mom, I think I need an umbrella, he called. Kiyomi-chan again. His mother called, sounding faintly amused, and he sighed as he nodded. His mother soon appeared holding an umbrella and a clear plastic poncho, helpfully tugging the ladder over Izuku, bag and all. Now properly equipped to brave the rain Izuku ventured outside once more, his mother waving all the while. When he reached the first floor he found a haggard-looking Yumimori-san, one of their neighbors, standing next to a sulking little girl. Seven-year-old Kiyomi had a rather adorable quirk called Mermaid, that gave her shimmering scales of many colors along her limbs and neck, along with gills to breathe underwater. As of three months ago, she had also developed a second quirk, which as far as they could tell created small, centralized rainstorms when she got upset. Rough morning. Izuku asked with a smile, and the girl's mother smiled tiredly. Kiyomi-chan really doesn't want to go to school, she explained with a tight laugh, and Izuku shot her a sympathetic smile. He felt a bit bad for the woman, as Kiyomi's tantrums had caused her to miss more than one day of school, since the storms could happen indoors too. He'd seen a lot of furniture come and go since the second quirk manifested, and naturally her school wasn't too keen on her ruining her classrooms. Hang in there, he said, and headed away from the storm with a small sigh. The radius is a bit bigger today, he noted, as the rain covered part of the neighboring building as well. Either Kiyomi's quirk was getting stronger as she matured, making it harder to control, or she had zero control issues and was doing it on purpose. It could go either way with that girl. At least it got lighter once you moved away from the epicenter. He ditched the poncho a block later, and put it in a plastic bag he'd started carrying just for Kiyomi's storms, glad to have shielded his backpack. The year had only just started, but he'd already gotten a major paper assigned that he'd spent hours on last night. He'd rather not have it ruined. He still felt embarrassed remembering having everything ruined the first day. Izuku didn't dwell on it long, as halfway through the walk to school a familiar voice called out. Midoriya Senpai, wait up. He felt himself smile as he turned to see another boy with red hair and a white headband with a honeycomb pattern racing towards him, waving excitedly. Hey, Hachinus-kun, he greeted. Rare to see you in the morning. 
You usually get to school first, don't you? The other boy grinned and folded his arms behind his head, matching Izuku's pace as they continued to Aldair. Yeah, but my mom overslept. Do you have any idea how hard it is to wake her up? Not really Izuku replied, and the other boy paused. Oh right, you've never met her, he realized aloud. Anyways, she's like impossible to wake up. We used to joke she had a secret second sloth court back before, you know. He shrugged vaguely, and Izuku nodded, his smile just a little tighter as he turned forward. Yeah. It had now been five years since the second court boom. Even now, no one understood just what caused so many people to suddenly spawn a second quirk, and why so many others had turned into monsters that day. The only things people knew for sure was that it only seemed to impact people in Japan that day, and that for the most part, children or people with weaker or more passive quirks, were more likely to get one. Overall, not many people got directly impacted by the boom though. It was estimated that all across Japan a little over 2,000 cases existed total, including the people who became monsters and villains who didn't report it. An exact number hadn't been found, in part due to the fact that some people only manifested the second quirk later. Honestly, the original estimate had been closer to half of the current one, but over the past five years it seemed that the second quirk was just dormant in some people, until some stressful event made it manifest. That was how Izuku got to know Hachinus Hakuto, his underclassman. The boy had been nervous about starting at Aldair, his family having moved to Misatafu all the way from Hokkaido for his father's work. The stress of starting middle school in a new place surrounded by strangers had caused his second quirk to activate. Carapace, as they came to call it, was a transformation-type quirk that caused his skin to shift into a crab-like shell. Needless to say, it had been a traumatic experience for the younger boy. Izuku happened to be passing by the stairwell where he'd hidden, and had ultimately talked him through his panic attack. Since then they hadn't necessarily become friends, but they occasionally spoke at school, and Izuku helped him figure out how to use carapace as well as hexagon shield. His right now, Hachinus was one of only a handful of students of Aldera to spawn a second quirk. There was a girl in his class who could control the length of her hair, and now had the added ability to trace bioluminescent patterns in her skin. There was another boy in his ear who could see in multiple color ranges, including in infrared, and then got the ability to burp rainbows. Izuku had already filled three whole pages debating with himself about whether the two quirks were somehow related. It was weird, but neat. Last year they'd also had a boy who could breathe in any environment, and then got one that let him basically realign and move his bones whenever he wanted. That had been interesting, though most of Izuku's classmates disagreed. Izuku missed him, he always smiled and was friendly to him. Probably because Izuku was one of the only kids who didn't treat him badly. In any event, Hachinus stood out at their school as the only kid whose two quirks could actually be pretty good for heroics. For that reason, he had become fairly popular so they didn't hang out too much. But Hachinus always went out of his way to smile and say hi, since Izuku had been the first one to help him understand his quirks. Even now, Hachinus excitedly chattered about some of the progress he'd made since the last time they spoke. Look, I can make them bigger now, see? He said, rolling up his sleeve to show the hexagon tiles printed on his arm. He grabbed one and peeled it off, the marking filling with a translucent reddish orange energy, and Izuku perked up as it expanded to roughly the size of his head. Wow, it really is bigger. He exclaimed excitedly. Last time it was closer to this size. He made a gesture with his hands to show the original size, slightly smaller than the current tile, and Hachinus grinned. Yeah, it's awesome. I still have trouble making multiple hexagons though, it feels like if I make them bigger I'm limited in how many I can make. Hachinus's original quirk, Hexagon Shield, allowed him to pull off the hexagon markings, and basically use them as shields. The shields could float freely, and he could connect more tiles to make them larger. To that end Izuku suggested helpfully, maybe instead of making them bigger, you should try to remove more at once then. They'll all connect in the end anyway, so you might be able to cover more space. That had Hachinus perking up. Quantity over quality, huh? He mused and beamed. Yeah, I'll try that later. Thanks, Midoriya Senpai. No problem, Izuku replied, and the two fell into a companionable silence as more students came into sight. Soon enough some of Hachinus's friends appeared to usher him off, leaving Izuku to finish the walk to Aldera alone. His smile faded slightly as he adjusted his grip on his backpack straps, stepping through the gates with a slightly heavy heart. As he got closer to the classroom he could hear more and more whispers, but he did his best to ignore them. The second quirk boom had left an indelible mark on everyone in Japan, whether it impacted them directly or not. In the case of the Midoriya family, it stood out for two reasons. First, Inko had developed a second quirk they later dubbed Burst Dash, which allowed her to launch herself forward short distances with a destructive momentum. It also came with added durability, which was good news considering what happened when she first manifested it. Even now, they still called it Crash sometimes. Second, Izuku had not gotten a quirk. It had been disheartening to realize that even now, while several other quirkless people had reported gaining a quirk that day, he had not. 
His classmates have been less than pleasant after realizing this, mocking him even further. Izuku tried not to let it dishearten him too much, but for a while he'd been particularly despondent, since his dreams of being a pro hero seemed to be even further out of reach. Still, he didn't let himself lose hope. The rise of people discovering their second quirks later gave him silent hope that his might just be another late one. The fact that Hachinus, who was already in middle school, could develop one, then seemed to encourage the fact. Even Kiyomi had only manifested hers this year. It wasn't impossible that his might be there right now, waiting for the right moment to make itself known. And if he didn't get one well, he'd become a pro hero anyway. Izuku had his heart set on that goal for as long as he could remember. He wasn't going to give up just because he might not have a quirk. As he slid into his seat and got out his notebook, he couldn't help the curl of longing in his chest though. With the advent of the second quirk boom, Izuku's fascination with quirks hadn't just grown stronger. It had been allowed to bloom and reach new levels, his hobby reaching near professional levels of expertise by the time he started middle school. There had been a lot of people who suddenly needed quirk counselors, which led to a long wait time. Izuku already had a reputation at school for obsessing over quirks, so it hadn't taken long for some of his classmates to approach him for an opinion for themselves or affected family members, while they waited to meet actual professionals. It was a nice reprieve from the constant isolation and bullying, so he'd been more than eager for the opportunities. The collection of notebooks once titled Hero Analysis for the Future had been redubbed simply Quirk Analysis to reflect the new variety of quirks featured inside. After speaking to so many different classmates, neighbors and other people's quirks, he had already reached volume 20. Even some of his classmates who didn't get a second quirk had come to him for an analysis of their own quirks. Beyond just being given more opportunities and information to practice with, people actually relying on his skills for once had also gotten him to brush up on a lot of the actual academic and medical research behind quirks, at least what was freely available online and at the library. It didn't change the fact he was alone though. At the end of the day he was still the weird quirkless kid who mumbled to himself all the time. Some people might be a little nicer now, but they weren't friends. And Kakin made up for any leeway he might have gotten from his other classmates. The blonde stalked into the classroom with a scowl like always, but this time he seemed a bit angrier. Considering he was partially drenched, it wasn't surprising. Izuku winced, realizing he must have crossed paths with Kiyomi and her mother. Usually Umemori-san took the seven-year-old to a candy shop to try to calm her tantrums, and that shop intersected with Bakugu's route to school. He shrunk back as Kakin stalked to his desk, dropping the backpack on the floor with a wet squelch before plopping into his chair. Thankfully his ire didn't seem to be directed at Izuku this time, more just directed at the world as a whole. That, and moving a lot in a wet uniform would be annoying. Still, by the time lunch rolled around he would be dry enough and probably take out some of his frustration on Izuku. The thought made him bite his lip. Once, he and Bakugu Katsuki had been best friends, even now he still considered the other boy one of his only friends. But after Izuku got diagnosed as quirkless while Kakin manifested the ever-flashy explosion, a rift had grown between them. Bakugu had taken to taunting and bullying him, getting harsher and harsher over the years. Most of the bullying took the form of verbal abuse, with some shoving and fighting here and there. Occasionally he'd make an explosion in front of Izuku to startle him, and sometimes he'd burn some of Izuku's stuff. Fortunately Bakugu never used his quirk directly on Izuku outside of a few instances as children, mainly because he understood how dangerous and volatile that power could be. Kakin might have been well, an asshole, but he wasn't a villain. Izuku quietly sighed to himself as the teacher arrived to call the class to order. Today was probably going to be stressful. Izuku was right. Today was stressful. Surprisingly Bakugu hadn't bothered him at lunch, but some other kids had instead. The bento his mother had painstakingly made had been spilled on the floor, the contents inedible, and Izuku had to get food from a vending machine instead. At least that paper for literature was safe and dry. Bakugu had actually exploded since his own paper had been ruined by the water. On a brighter note, Bakugu had decided to vent his frustrations on Hachinus instead. Normally venting out his frustrations would be a bad thing, but in this case it was honestly more amusing than anything. Hachinus's second quirk had made him a bit of a celebrity overnight at Aldair, the combination seeming to guarantee him a one-way ticket to heroics. Previously only Bakugu had been a clear contender, so to have an underclassman steal his thunder had sparked his competitive side. What made it amusing was that Hachinus didn't know who Bakugu was. Izuku had tried to explain it to him multiple times, but it never seemed to click with the younger boy. Hachinus vaguely recognized Kakin as that upperclassman who always challenges me, but never attained why. Izuku honestly couldn't tell if Hachinus was genuinely forgetting, or just messing with him. Every time Kakin challenged him to something, it ended with the blonde yelling in frustration regardless of the outcome. Even today, after winning a speed-eating contest at lunch, Kakin had been left fuming when Hachinus congratulated Bakuno Senpai on his victory. Izuku thought Hachinus just enjoyed all the free food offered by their classmates. It had been a funny break in an otherwise long and stressful day. 
Eventually the date came to an end and Izuku headed home alone as always, though before he left he found some tacks in his shoes. It wasn't often people targeted his stuff like that Kakin actually got pissed whenever it happened, because it was so cowardly in his view but Izuku had gotten in the habit of checking just to be safe. After pouring the tax onto the floor and getting some startled and concerned looks from the other kids around him, Izuku had decided he'd earn a treat. When tax to mom to let her know he'd be late and half an hour later, Izuku sat at a small bakery eating a slice of chocolate cake. On days like this he felt it important to treat himself so his mood wouldn't get too low. He browsed hero forums on his phone idly as he ate, snorting at all the memes, and clicking every discussion or analysis that seemed interesting. While scrolling down the page one title caught his eye, and Izuku nearly choked on his cake when he read it. All Might in Misatafu. He quickly jabbed the link with all the force he could muster, and found a thread discussing rumored sightings of the number one hero in Misatafu starting this morning. Izuku nearly squealed with delight as he read each post, a few people chiming in to claim they'd seen him firsthand. Why would All Might be in Misatafu? The man traveled all over Japan fighting villains, but Musatafu wasn't a crime hotspot or anything. If anything, the proximity to UA made it one of the most well-patrolled cities in all of Japan, if not the whole world. When you had dozens of pro heroes all taking a day job at one location, they tended to like patrolling nearby to keep the commute short. Maybe if he got lucky, All Might would be here for a few days, and he'd be able to see All Might in person. Actually, what if All Might was patrolling right now? His body began to thrum with excitement at the thought, and he nearly inhaled his cake in a rush to finish and go searching for his idol. In his rush, he ate a little too fast though, and nearly choked on it for different reasons than before. As he choked a heavy hand patted his back a few times, helping dislodge the sweet from his throat. Slow down, kid. Someone chuckled behind him. I know the cake's good, but you should savor it, not try to eat it all at once. Izuku took a few breaths to make sure his throat was clear before turning in his seat with a sheepish smile. Sorry, I guess I got a little excited, he said with a half-hearted laugh. I just found out some really great news, and I wanted to hurry up and go. The man who patted his back merely smiled, seeming more amused than annoyed. He was incredibly tall for someone without a mutation quirk, with shaggy-looking blonde hair and bright blue eyes that contrasted his lightly tanned skin. He had a rather lanky build, not too thin but still less muscular than he'd expect of someone of that height. That's alright, but don't rush or you'll choke, he warned, and Izuku nodded. Right, thanks. He turned back to finish his cake at a more sedate pace, after which he dumped his trash and hurried out to go find All Might. Unknown to him, his hopes would be in vain, and also had already been half answered. The man he wanted to see had just left the same restaurant Izuku had, his work already done for the day before Izuku even saw the post. It was an unremarkable encounter, one neither would have reason to remember. However, in a mere 24 hours they would meet again. And when they did, nothing would ever be the same. The day Izuku's life change started normally. He woke up to his alarm, the booming sound of I am here. Echoing through his dreams. Like every morning, he reached over to lightly bash All Might's head to turn it off, the brief pinch of the two hair spikes digging into his hand, waking him up further. Yawning, he sat up and rubbed his eyes, blinking blearily as he willed the last of his sleepiness to leave. And then his fingertips brushed against some kind dip in his palms. The feeling caught his attention, rubbing against it just to be sure. Yep, he could feel some kind of small indentation on both hands. Izuku, he blinked slowly, head tilting ever so slightly. Then he abruptly startled and most of his sleep vanished because he had holes in his palms. Yeah, his day was normal for about 30 seconds. Now much more awake and alert, he raised his hands closer to his face to look between each one rapidly. The holes really didn't seem that big, barely the width of the very tip of his pinky. Were they actually there? Was he still half asleep and just dreaming? He blinked and rubbed his eyes again before taking another look. The holes were gone. Once again Izuku just stared at his palms, confusion reaching peak levels as he saw them blank. What he muttered out loud, eyebrows furrowing. The skin was now whole again, as if the holes never existed. And maybe they never did. Maybe it was just a dream, a hyper-realistic dream while on the edge of sleep. But he'd felt them, hadn't he? He felt his fingertips brush against it when he closed his hand to rub his eyes. After several seconds he sighed and got up. No point in dwelling on it now. He went about the rest of his morning routine in relative silence, but his mind kept going back to those holes. Despite his initial disbelief, the sudden disappearance still felt disappointing. He hadn't actually expected them to randomly disappear when he rubbed his eyes to check. Those brief few seconds seemed to set the tone for the rest of the day. It must have thrown him off more than he initially realized, because his mom ended up commenting on it during breakfast. Is something wrong, sweetie? She asked, sounding vaguely worried as she sat across from him. You seem quieter than usual. Izuku shrugged as he nibbled on the last of his toast, swallowing before answering. Uh, not exactly I just, I guess I had a hyper-realistic dream or something right before waking up, or something, it's just, when I first woke up I thought I saw holes on my hands, but they're gone now. Holes? 
Inko repeated, glancing back at him with a frown. Honey, you don't think she trailed off, not daring to finish the thought aloud, but you knew what she meant. Could it be Quirk? I don't know, he replied, and he honestly didn't. The hulls hadn't even been there for a full 30 seconds before vanishing, and he had no idea how to make them appear in the first place. I guess I'll just keep an eye out today and see how it goes. Anyways, I need to get going if I want to get to school on time. Alright, his mother agreed. Let me just grab your lunch for you. As she spoke she twisted to face the counter where the bento box sat, and Izuku gave a small jolt as it began floating towards him. She had used her quirk thousands of times, but this time he almost felt a small surge of energy, or adrenaline, or, or something, watching her use it. Maybe it was because of how the holes were still on his mind. He glanced down at his bare palms with a slight frown. If the holes were quirk, maybe it was some kind of suction or vacuum quirk. Like he could suck things towards him, sort of like how his mother could attract small objects towards her. Or maybe it did the opposite, and created gusts of air to push stuff away. The thoughts haunted him even as he pulled on his shoes. His thoughts stalled briefly when he opened the door though. Hey mom, can you grab the rain poncho for me? He called. Huh? Oh, sure. His mom appeared a few moments later, holding out the plastic poncho and its accompanying bag. Kiyomi-chan again. Looks like it, he replied absently as he shrugged it on. The rain was more of a light drizzle, not as heavy as yesterday, but still unpleasant to walk through without an umbrella. Kiyomi must have only just activated a quirk, and he'd rather not get caught in it once it got heavier. Izuku made sure his backpack was covered before stepping outside. I'll see you after school, mom. Okay sweetie, have a good day. Inko waved him off before closing the door, Izuku hurrying down the street before the rain could pick up. Izuku found his mind wandering as he walked to school. Today Hachinus didn't show up to join him, leaving him plenty of time to ponder about those holes. He glanced down at his palm and frowned, willing the holes to appear, but of course nothing happened. If they did exist and weren't a figment of his imagination, maybe they only appeared when he actively used them. He paused and took a deep breath, before thrusting one palm out towards a nearby tree. Okay, suck up those leaves. He silently ordered himself, thinking back to his mom's quirk. Nothing happened. Okay, blow them away. He amended. Nothing happened then either. Old man Murata shot him an odd look as he passed by on his morning jog though, making Izuku wince and smile sheepishly before continuing on his way. Okay, so obviously that wasn't enough to work. Maybe he was doing it wrong. Maybe it was a pure transformation type thing, with no emitter abilities. If so, maybe he could make more holes appear on other parts of his body. He abruptly stopped as an image of his face with holes in place of freckles flashed through his mind, and gave a full body shudder. Please no, he whispered to himself as he kept walking, shoulders hunched a little higher. As much as Izuku would love a quirk, that one was a bit too creepy for his liking. It'd probably just freak out everyone around him, and also, imagining holes all over his body felt kind of disturbing. His mind flashed back to that live broadcast several years ago, that nurse whose arms stretched out like taffy with the raw-looking flesh forming the tiny strips. He promptly locked that thought away, and silently mourned the loss of the four-month streak of not thinking about that particular transformation. Izuku kept wondering about the holes the whole walk, only stopping when he came across a villain fight. A giant of a man had climbed atop Tadun Station, a bullet train station on an overpass that crossed over a street. That was a disaster waiting to happen if Izuku had ever seen one, and the man had already knocked down part of an electrical pole, which had been caught by death arms. That craft and death arms had taken up crowd control, the rescue specialist making a water fence to keep people at a safe distance, while Kamui Woods confronted him. Izuku craned his head to watch with unabashed awe as the wooden hero leaped onto the tracks, neatly dodging the villain's attacks. Assault, robbery, and illegal use of powers during rush hour traffic, he intoned as he dodged a giant palm that slammed onto the tracks where he'd been standing. You have violated many laws, and it's time to face justice. He swung out his arm as he spoke, and Izuku let out a delighted gasp, as he saw the wood beginning to warp and twist into spiky branches. Here it comes. He called, recognizing the hero's special move. Show us something flashy, tree man. The man next to him called. Izuku couldn't hear Kamui from this distance, but he could imagine the pro's voice as he mouthed the name of the attack to himself, eyes sparkling with delight, and his body thrumming with anticipation. Preemptive binding lacquered prison. The hero's arm shot forward at the last part, branches practically exploding forth and stretching towards the villain. The villain started to dodge to the side even before Kamui moved, one hand reaching for another part of the building. No doubt he planned to grab it and try to topple it. At the same moment, a loud shout rang through the air, and Izuku turned his head to see a giant woman flinging through the air towards the villain. Canyon snipe. Even as he watched she began rapidly shrinking, closer to the villain's size, as she delivered a kick to his arm with both feet. The sudden impact led to a loud crack, and sent him almost tumbling over with a pained shout, and the woman continued to shrink to a more normal size. Those few split seconds gave Kamui Wood's attack the time needed to reach him, wrapping around his body like a wooden cocoon. 
Several people gasped as the now normal sized woman disappeared into the wooden bindings. The arm she just kicked pulled towards the villain's side as he fell directly onto said side. Damn, is she okay? The man next to Izuku sputtered, but Izuku's mind was already whirling. No, those bindings are too tight for her to be in them, he mumbled to himself. If she was inside, there'd be more space, Kamui Woods wouldn't do it. And her size changed, so maybe he trailed off as he saw a flash of purple and gold against the wood binding the villain's arm, and a few seconds later the woman seemed to spring into existence, arms flinging upwards with a smile as she turned to face the crowd. A flawless victory. She called, and then yelled when Kamui Woods abruptly whacked her on the head. Miss Measure, you can't just fly in at the last second like that. He scolded. I could have hurt you. Oh, come on, it's not that dangerous. And that guy was totally reaching for that corner of the station to try to knock it down. At that distance his arm wouldn't have reached it in time. As the two bickered loudly the crowd was somewhat quiet, watching with a faintly mystified air. Miss Measure. Someone muttered. That's a new name. Think it's her debut? Someone else asked. The bickering seemed to reach its peak as the heroine stamped her foot before spinning back to the crowd, leaping onto the street below. The crowd grew hushed as she rapidly grew until she towered over even the giant villain, flashing the crowd a smile. Everyone, it is so nice to meet you. She called with a bright smile. I am the multi-size heroine, Miss Measure, and today marks my entry into the hero scene. I look forward to serving all of you. Haparazzi seemed to spawn instantly, cameras flashing as she struck a pose. Izuku could hear the excited chatter grow, watching with white eyes as she turned to pick up the bound villain and lower him to the street for police. A multi-size heroine. That implied she could grow and shrink. It could be one quirk, but... No, it's two, some instinctive voice declared, and something about that felt right. Pro heroes with two quirks were still relatively rare, as only a few established pros had developed a second one during the second quirk boom. Most people to get a second quirk had been young or otherwise had quirks not really suited for heroics, after all. But now that five years had passed, there had been enough time for more people affected by it to go to high school and graduate from heroics programs. Come to think of it, there were some articles about hero students getting new quirks after the second boom first happened, and one of them mentioned a female student with a gigantification quirk who got a shrinking one mismeasure, looks like she might be around that age, so it could have been her. Having two quirks will make her really popular by default, but that's also a really dangerous combination and can cause a lot of damage if she's not careful. She must have used the extra few years to focus on her training. Even as he mumbled Izuku pulled out his notebook, scribbling away his thoughts. It was just so rare to see a pro hero with two quirks, and it really got his mind whirling. Ho, oh, taking notes, are we? The man next to him commented, startling him out of his thoughts. When he glanced over the man was grinning at him good-naturedly. You're a real fanboy, aren't you? You wanna be a hero too? Absolutely. Izuku replied with a bright grin, and the man laughed. That's great. You sound sharp, so good luck to you. Izuku smiled and thanked him before returning the notebook to his bag, as police began ushering the crowd away. The diversion hadn't taken too long, and he continued the trek to school, feeling grateful he didn't need to take the train given the tracks had been damaged. As he left the scene of the battle behind he felt his smile fade though, glancing at his palm once more. So, as third year students, it's time for you to think seriously about what you want to do with your lives. And you know what that means. It's time to fill out handouts for your future plans. Izuku's homeroom teacher lifted a sheaf of papers as he faced the class, a wry grin on his face as he added, but even if I do, you're all pretty much planning to go into the hero course, right? Izuku's classmates erupted into cheers at the remark, all of them showing off their quirks. The energy in the room felt more palpable than ever, as he twisted in his seat to look around at the displays of power, limbs twisting and stretching in various ways, and bodies warping with the effects of their quirks. He paid little attention to the teacher's reminder that they couldn't use their quirks in public, his mind buzzing with anticipation. Everyone's quirks felt so incredible. Most of them were what most people considered weak, but that didn't make them anything short of amazing. He felt a quiet sense of awe at each and every one of them, but none filled him with as much quiet excitement as Kakin's. Sparks flickered around his hands as he scoffed, his taunting remarks lost as Izuku's gaze focused on the blonde's hands. Explosion was such a powerful quirk, and one absolutely fitting of a pro hero. Bakugou would absolutely be one of the best heroes, and Izuku absolutely couldn't wait to see his career unfold. In his awe it took him a few seconds to notice the room had gone silent, and when he glanced up everyone was looking at him. He blinked and tilted his head, stammering a confused, what? Everyone immediately burst into laughter, and Bakugou sprung from his seat to slam exploding palms on Izuku's desk, the force nearly knocking Izuku's chair over. Whatever he said next was lost on him, Izuku just staring at his hands, and the wisps of smoke drifting from the wood beneath his palms. He had probably seen Bakugou's quirk in action even more often than his mom's, but today it felt particularly mesmerizing for some reason. What if those holes could produce explosions too? Izuku discarded the thought immediately and hoped that wasn't the case. 
As much as he loved Bakugou's quirk, having his own version of it would just feel wrong. Also, I'm still not even sure those holes were real. Why am I thinking about it so much hold on, did Kakin just say you He finally, finally tuned back into Bakugou's rant, only catching the tail end of it. Father, got it. He snapped, and Izuku stared at him blankly. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't catch any of that. He said meekly after a few seconds. The classroom erupted into even more laughter, their classmates' howls only barely drowning out Kakin's explosions and shriek of rage. The rest of the day passed in a similar manner. Izuku found it harder to focus than ever, taking notes in class on autopilot, while his mind kept straying to his classmates. He couldn't stop thinking about their quirks after that morning, there was just such a wide variety. From Hina San transforming her hand into fire, to Europe Khan who could stretch his neck side to side, to even Anaguro Khan's eyeballs popping out of his head. All of them were so amazing. At lunch he hauled himself away in the classroom, intending to scribble some more notes and ideas about the holes in his palms, which he still couldn't say for sure existed. He filled out five lines on a fresh page before he ultimately got distracted by a flutter of movement from the window. Kazumaki-san was creating spirals of wind around her palms to scatter flower petals made by a girl from another class, Izuku pressing his face to the glass to watch in awe. The scene was just so mesmerizing. He could see the petals peel off the girl's skin like stickers in the light breeze, but it obviously didn't hurt, given how she laughed. Another girl from the year below joined in, blowing some bubbles into the mix with the same gesture as blowing a kiss. This was obviously meant to impress Hachinus, who sat not far away watching and cheering. The show only lasted a couple minutes before stopping. Then Izuku got distracted by another pair of students outside, as one used a quirk to trace lines in the air, that made animated drawings that faded after a few seconds as he told the story. And then another kid nearby shook a rock with glowing hands, and cracked it open to reveal a geode. Long story short, Izuka Kinda forgot about lunch until the last five minutes. Everyone's quirks were just so interesting. He filled out like three whole pages with notes and ideas on eleven different people, which made that one page with only five measly lines on the holes feel kind of underwhelming. I still don't even know if that was real or not, he thought as he glanced over it. School had ended and everyone else had begun heading out, Izuka lingering to wait for the initial rush to thin out. He took the opportunity to review his notes and continue to ponder, well, everything. It was rare for him to fill out three pages in such a short time, but then again, these weren't exactly his best work. Usually he liked to dedicate multiple pages to each quirk, including basic analysis of abilities, basic observation notes, hypothetical questions, potential applications. All pretty basic stuff. This time his attention just kept flitting about though. Every time someone new used a quirk, he'd lose interest in the last one, and start a new section full of rapid-fire bullet points. It made for a chaotic and hectic read. Suddenly the notebook was yanked out of his hands, surprising him, and he snapped his head up to see Bakugo looking over it with a scowl. What the hell are you up to now, Deku? He growled as he flipped through it, his two friends crowding around with taunting grins. Yo, Kasuki, what's that? One of them asked. A diary or something. Rather than respond Bakugo slammed the notebook on Izuku's desk. Why the hell are you randomly taking notes on everyone? He demanded, meeting Izuku's gaze with a scowl. You've been zoning out all day so I thought you'd be up to something weird, but this is just stupid. Didn't you already write down all that creepy stalker bullshit by now? I don't actually know why I did that. Izuku responded slowly. His answer seemed to actually throw Bakugu for a loop, his scowl fading momentarily as the green-haired boy awkwardly shrugged. I just feel really weird today, I think. And I don't know why I did that, so, uh, several seconds passed as he trailed off, no one speaking. Can I have that back? Given how long he'd known Kakin, he wasn't surprised that he responded by exploding the notebook and throwing it out the window. Look, Deku, he growled, hands sparking as they rested on his desk. You've been acting really weird all day, but I don't care about that. Just don't even bother replying to you, eh, got it. You don't even have a quirk. Suddenly Izuku's mind flashed back to homeroom that morning, and he finally started to realize just what had gotten Bakugou so worked up back then. He had heard something about Yue, though he couldn't remember it clearly. Still, the threat made him frown, something defensive curling in his chest. W we don't know that for a fact though. He argued. A lot of people are getting their new quirks later, like Hiyomi in her storm quirk last year, or Hachinus Kun when he first. Don't mention that bastard. Bakugou slammed his hands on the table with explosions powerful enough to scorch the wood, leaving Izuku in awe the table hadn't broken under the force. His eyes snapped to Kakin's hands almost instinctively, and he had to consciously tear his gaze away to focus as his childhood friend spoke. That two quirk extras got nothing to do with this. I don't care what quirk you might get even if you do get one. With that bastard around I won't be the only student from this garbage dump to get into UA, but I'll still be the first. So don't even bother applying. He turned and stalked off, his friends throwing some jeering comments as they followed. Izuka paid them no attention though, focused on Tasaki's overly elongated fingers as he waved and Zenshi's sharp teeth. 
both such small, minor quirks, but no less fascinating weight, Kakin threw his notebook out the window. Crap. Izuku groaned as he quickly packed the rest of his stuff before going to search for it. To prove that today just couldn't go well, he found it in the fish pond because of course he did. He sighed as he retrieved the soggy notebook, looking at it with a grimace. The thing he used, mostly, waterproofing these days after some other accidents, that wouldn't help all the entries written in pencil though. He sighed as he began the trek home, shoulders slumped in disappointment as he held the notebook to his chest with one arm. Today hadn't been too rough, but somehow this felt like an oddly fitting end. Still, what was up with his attention flitting around so much? He'd always been interested in quirks, but they'd never distracted him to the extent they did today. The thought made him frown, deciding to try to avoid crowds and just get home. Maybe then I can actually focus on that thing with the holes. Izuku stopped walking at the end of an underpass, stretching his free hand out from the shade, so the sunlight illuminated his palm clearly. Still no sign of the holes he'd seen and felt that morning, just clean, unbroken skin. Once again he had to wonder if they actually did exist, given he'd only seen them for a few seconds total. It felt kind of silly to be so hung up on it so much, but he couldn't help it. Part of him had hoped that they were real, because that would mean he now had a quirk. Lost in thought, he almost didn't notice the rumbling noise behind him. He did notice the metallic clang of the sower lid bouncing and shifting in its opening though, and he turned to see something green and liquid rise out of the small holes carved in it. Eyeballs rolled around the mass before settling on him, and he saw teeth spread in a crooked grin. Izuku's breath caught at the sight of mutation quirk. Is his body made of sludge? It looks like it, it's too dim to see clearly in the shade, but I think it's slightly translucent. Is the sludge closer to a liquid or a solid? Is the sludge sticky? Can they wear clothes, or would it make fabric too wet? Maybe they have to wear rubber clothes. Do they leave behind a residue whenever they touch stuff? They don't seem to be constrained to a human shape. Can they shape shift? A medium-sized invisibility cloak perfect. It took a few seconds for the words to register, still caught up in his thoughts. Ha, huh, is it just me or are the teeth changing size? Are they the same material as the rest of his body? Can he manipulate the hardness of them? What about eyes? Also come to think about it, if he's translucent where are his internal organs? Are they made of the same stuff? I can't see them even this close weight, why is he suddenly so close, and oh my god did he just absorb me? And that was how Midori Izuku stood and did absolutely nothing as a man made of sludge lunged and wrapped around him like a slimy anaconda. By the time he realized what was happening his mouth and nose were already covered by green liquid, which had a consistency closer to mud than water, but that didn't matter because he couldn't breathe. Izuku had absolutely no oxygen in his lungs, and like any person suffocating, his first instinct was to take a deep breath. That just made more sludge pour into his mouth. Crap crap crap. Wow, you making this really easy for me, kid. The villain's voice sounded right next to his ear as he wrapped around him, leaving Izuku's hands largely free. He began struggling madly, panic taking over as he tried to clamp his mouth shut to no avail. His stupid reflexive inhale had cost him dearly, releasing what little oxygen he'd still had, and bringing him that much closer to suffocating. Flailing his limbs did nothing. Prying at the man's arms did nothing, fingers just sinking into the goo-like body. Even at this range he couldn't really see into the man's body, but his eye was close enough that Izuku could see it was more solid looking than the rest of it. So it was probably made of a different substance. Focus. He screamed at his flighty mind. He was drowning, and he still wondered about this guy's quirk, what was wrong with him today. Was it because he woke up with those weird holes those holes? His mind flashed back to his, if a quirk was ever going to activate, now's the time. Izuku dug both palms into the sludge around his mouth, squeezing his eyes shut and concentrating in praying. He could feel the sludge all around him, could feel it against his open palms. Come on, holes, open up and suck it up. Did he need to use some sort of trigger? Some visual trigger in his mind. Some people with the mere quirks described stuff like that. He pressed his eyelids tighter as he focused on the feeling of the sludge against his skin, squeezing them so tight that spots soon appeared. Among those spots appeared a light, if you could call it that. It didn't exactly look bright, instead having a sort of murky feel to it that reminded him of the sludge encasing him. Good enough. Izuku imagined himself reaching for it, hoping this would work as a visual anchor or something. His fingers flexed and twitched as he pictured himself grabbing onto it, and he swore he could feel it. It felt not quite solid, but also more substantial than he'd expected, and a bit slippery. The fact he could feel it gave him a spark of hope that this was how quirks were supposed to work and feel. Izuku offered one last silent prayer to whatever deities might exist that this quirk could suck up the sludge, and pulled. Tashinori had been pursuing the sludge villain for the better part of an hour. He stumbled across the fiend in the midst of robbing a local store, and when he promptly inflated into his all might form the coward had fled to the sewers. That had been less than enjoyable. Tashinori wouldn't shy away from something like that, but he'd definitely need a shower when this was over. Especially since he had the bright idea to use his glowing handprints to help light the way. He openly grimaced as he raced through the sewers, skimming for any signs of the villain. 
The cellar water wasn't the same murky green as the villain's body, but it still had a rather disturbing brown tint that easily hid the sludge. He caught sight of the villain several times only for him to sink deeper into the depths where Toshinori couldn't see him as well in the darkness. He had to come up for air sometime though. A loud scream rang from above, making him stop. His head snapped back to see a solar lid, having almost missed it, since it apparently wasn't facing the open sky, and thus lacked any light. Around the small hulls he could see traces of a green residue of some kind, which coupled with the scream was all he needed. He sprang upwards and burst out of the sower, the lid bouncing against the underside of a bridge with a loud clatter. Normally upon making his grand entrance, Tashinori would spout his famous catchphrase to assure any victims. Have no fear, for I am here. This time the words never left his mouth though. His eyes skimmed the scene to assess the source of the scream, and he found himself frozen. Sprawled on the ground was a nude man, fortunately lying on his stomach but clearly unconscious. Next to him was what looked to be the sludge villain, except he was much smaller than before and wore a middle school uniform. His mouth tore open with a warped sounding cry, teeth sliding around as his head snapped towards Toshinori with white eyes, and even in the shadows of the underpass, he could see one more key difference. The villain he'd fought had red eyes. This person, however, had green. He stood in stunned silence as he surveyed the scene with widening eyes. This wasn't the villain he'd been chasing. All his years of experience allowed him to quickly discern all of the minute differences between this child and the culprit he'd been pursuing. For some reason he couldn't discern though Toshinori felt a sudden pang of dread as panicked eyes settled on him, a panic cry echoing with that same warped quality the villain had. They all might, HH help, a considerably younger voice cried. 